November 6, 2016's <laughs> regular meeting of the school committee. Please stand and um, join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Um, I will quickly run through our agenda and then the school committee will be taking a vote to enter into executive session in order to comply <coughs> with or act under the authority of the Mass General Laws specific to the review of executive session minutes for release and then we will reconvene in open session and um, have the remainder of our meeting. The rest of the agenda is that there will be recognitions, there will be an opportunity for the first public comment, there will be reports to the school committee including student council, um, John Evans from Keep Tech, liaison reports, the school committee chair report, the superintendent's report, and the assistant superintendent's district performance report. We have under new business the turf field committee appointments, a open meeting law complaint response, the request for a level B paraprofessional, the student activities account balance increase request, school committee policy EHB, the electronic records retention, school committee policy KHC, the distribution of materials, and school committee policy FF, naming of facilities or events. And under old business, we have school committee policy IJNDB, the internet acceptable use policy for its second reading. We then will have our second opportunity for public comment and then items by consensus and then adjournment. So at this time, I would seek a motion to enter into executive session to comply with or act under the authority of Mass General Law specific to the review of executive session minutes for release and to reconvene in open session. So moved. Second. Motion by Mr. Graziano, seconded by Ms. Kavanaugh, and this is a roll call vote. Ms. Richmond? Yes. Yes. Ms. Kavanaugh? Sorry. Yes. Mr. Graziano? Yes. Ms. Knight? Yes. And I'm a yes, and it's unanimous, and so we will now enter into executive session, and then we will return. <laughs>
always explode. Every time I bring in the spin pack and I forget to open it before, it goes all over the whole room. We have re-entered our regular meeting, and Dr. McLeod, do you have any recognitions this evening? I do not have any recognitions this evening. Really? No. Except to recognize Dr. Kavanaugh for being here. So <laughs> <laughs> we're going to hear from her shortly. Okay. okay, so at this time, we have come to our first opportunity for public comment. Is there anyone here from the public that would like to speak this evening? Okay, there is no one that's volunteered, so we can move on to reports to the school committee. And our first report is from, excuse me, our student council representative. I have David and Tacky. Did I say it right, David? And Olivia Spar. Olivia, you came last time, so welcome back. And you guys can Please join come us on up. right Thank over you. There. I do like this setup. Yeah. This is yeah. better. Okay, so. Um, so you're sharing the mic, so you'll have oh to yeah. just, yeah. Perfect. <laughs> just tilt it. Um, we're really excited to, or I'm really excited to be back. Um, I'm very excited to have someone from student council come each week, or uh, every two weeks. Um, so we got the chance to meet with Mr. Bishop and kind of talk about a few things that we wanted to touch upon for this meeting. So um, last meeting, I think Ryan and I talked about the Hiller Day, which is the, um, one day every month when we come in um, about 30 minutes late to um, the school day to kind of test out how students react to getting some extra sleep. And so we had that last week and everybody loved it. Um, it was really <laughs> nice to get um, just even those extra 30 minutes of sleep. Um, and it only took off about five minutes of each class, which was nice. <coughs> so it wasn't um, too big um, of a loss of class time. So. Um, so, overall, I think it had a really positive impact, and we're excited to have that continue throughout the whole year. And um, one thing to note, when we do have those days, we don't have our advisory on Thursdays, so that's also accounting for the time that uh, we could possibly lose. All right, and um, this past Tuesday, there was the induction of NHS people. 167 students of juniors and seniors were inducted. Um, NHS is, stands for Nos National Honor Society um, to recognize students with high achievement in both academ academics and leadership and community service. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, a few people. <laughs> Uh, after the induction, talked about how um, one of the teachers at our school, Mr. Prescott, spoke, and um, he talked about kids these days. And um, d if you want to like talk about that a little bit too, I know that that people love that. Yeah. So his speech was based on the quote "kids <laughs> these days" and how um, they're thought of as kids who are always on their phone um, or technology and are connected. Um, Whoa. But kids, he <laughs> went on to say that kids these days are um, always thanking him after class, and they're the ones volunteering their time in community service and um, kind of going in a direction that kids these days are going to change the world. And um, we should wear the phrase kids these days as a badge of honor almost, that um, we're a new generation that's going to uh, ignite change. So um, that was definitely a key moment, I think, at NHS. Um, also, we had, uh, during the presidential debate, um, Mr. Simos, the AP government teacher, organized for the debate to be shown in the auditorium on the big screen. And um, over 150 students and a few parents actually came, and some teachers too. So that was, um, I was able to go. And it was really nice to be there with all the other kids who are really interested in the debate and kind of watch it in an environment where you're really paying attention. And I know that if I was at home, I'd 
kind of ha like have to be paying attention. Um, so it was really nice to get that experience with everybody else. Um, Spirit Week is happening here at the high school next next week, so the week of the 17th, um, followed by Pep Rally that Friday. Um, spirit Week is a week to for all the students to show their spirit for Hopkinton High School. Um, each day dedicated to uh, a, a theme. So this year we have Color Blast, Pajama, um, day. Pajama day, Tiki. Yeah, Safari Tiki. Safari Tiki Day. And then America Day. America Day. <laughs> and then Pep Rally, which is Friday, <coughs> will be where you, where we wear our shirts. And for Pep Rally, get all excited and um, go in the athletic center and um, show our spirit, be loud, have fun. Yes. So everyone's really excited for that. Um, also at the last meeting, I think we touched upon the homework free weekend, the long weekends. So we had a homework free long weekend this past weekend. Um, and again, students really enjoyed that. And teachers um, were able to work around that with tests and quizzes and all that. So um, I think the students really appreciate that we can focus on family and friends during the longer breaks rather than um, school, which is our main focus throughout the week. So, and we'll have an upcoming um, homework free weekend again with Columbus Day. So, oh, sorry, I, me again. Um, <laughs> we had, we had the first home football game, which everyone was also really excited about since they were in Medway before. And even in the rain, we had so many students come and <laughs> cheer on the football team. So we're looking forward to even more games and the homecoming game after pep rally too. Yeah. Um. Yesterday was the Keep Smiling field hockey event, which happens every year. I wasn't there this year, but I was there last year. And going last year, it seemed like a very exciting event, um, both watching the field hockey parents versus the kids, but also a day to remember Abby and um, what she left behind here at Hopkins High School. Um, it's like I said, an event where the varsity field hockey and junior varsity, pretty sure, um, play against the parents and um, coaches, I'm pretty sure. And yeah, it's a game to <coughs> commemorate Abby. Um, we also had the senior parent night uh, a week or two ago, and then junior parent night is tonight. Um, and those event or the senior night I know went really well. My mom um, thought that it was very helpful with the guidance counselors running through all the information, um, mainly focusing on college applications and the uh, parents of now freshmen in college, I believe were on a panel to give some advice. So um, I think that went really well and the parents appreciated the help running through all the details because there are a lot. And I'm sure junior parent night is also going really well. So. School Council is going to have their first meeting soon. Um, when we were talking to Mr. Bishop, he seemed very excited about that. It's a group of students, and teachers, and parents um, in administration um, that meet every now and then. I don't know the frequency, but um, this first meeting at least, Mr. Bishop said they'd be talking about updating the expectations in the handbook. Um, like the social and civic expectations because Mr. Bishop was saying how they're a bit outdated for our current time. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, um, just touching upon the grades and I-pass, they just opened up um, the <coughs> progress reports for students to look at. And, um, and now they are a little bit early, so um, we're trying to encourage students not to be too stressed if the grade isn't exactly what they're expecting um, because they're probably are only a few assessments in there. Um, but as of last year, the IPASS was open um, more frequently than before, so students could keep updated. But um, <coughs> I believe for second semester, we're going to be transitioning to a new um, grading site, so students will be able to see it um, all the time and make sure that they can monitor their grade in each class. So um, a lot of new things, but um, some updates too, so hopefully that was helpful. 
from us. Who won the uh, parents versus field hockey game? Sorry, what about it? The Abby, the, um, the, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting what the name of the event was. Keep smiling. Yeah, I, it, was it, was in, it was in August. Actually, the parents um, play community members and the varsity plays alumni. Oh. <laughs> I think oh. this year varsity won, which they, they have not won before. Um, they haven't beaten the alumni before, so that's a big deal. There's I, a huge trophy. I think they also had um, uh, just a regular season Keep Smiling game. I think oh, they played okay. against It was Holliston. yesterday. Oh, so oh, I, yeah. I, oh, was that? Yeah, oh, that's uh, not the, was I talking about? I think you blend, maybe blend it oh, yeah, okay. into one. <laughs> I think they tried to kind of coordinate them a little bit, like say, similar like fundraisers and all that. Um, but I think that, I know like during the school day, they wore their Keep Smiling shirts as a way to raise awareness. Um, and they had an announcement at the end of the day encouraging people to come. Um, so yeah, unfortunately both of us couldn't be there, but I think it was kind of their regular season game, but yeah. for Abby. Thank you. Did you have Thank you. Thanks Very so good. much, and thanks for waiting. Oh, no problem. <laughs> okay. Okay, at this time, we would invite Mr. John Evans up to present to us about um, Keefe Tech, and I know you had a presentation prepared for us, so yeah, thank so you for Yeah, so I've been us. working closely with John um, over the past few years, and you know, you've heard me speak before about the wonderful opportunities for students at Keefe Tech and about how important I think it is personally that kids know about this as an opportunity and that it's not frowned upon um, if that's a choice that students make. Um, I know that I toured the facility and was so impressed with the many options for kids. Um, so I invited John here tonight because I thought it would be interesting for you to just get a, a quick overview um, of, of everything that's going on over there. And it's timely because I believe our eighth graders come soon. November 4th. So this is also something new that, that we've put in place um, with Mr. Keller's um, blessing. It, we didn't used to have a field trip. We were one of only a few districts that didn't, didn't participate in that way. Um, and again, I, I feel like it's important for kids to know and to see it for themselves. So we now have a field trip that all eighth graders, I think they attended last year for the first time, John? There were all the eighth graders attended last year for the first time. Okay. And with that, I'll turn it over to you. Maybe I just took your whole presentation. <laughs> a little bit, but thank you. <laughs> okay. Well, I have a presentation here, but it's not quite there um, yet. It was there earlier. Oh, <laughs> I just did seem to think it was going to pop right up. Okay. But yeah, I think it was switching yeah, the source for the projector. It was, I think, is what happened. Is the projector on? No. Well, because I don't know how you tell the power. There we go. There we go. There, it's green now. Maybe. Who has the source key button? Oh, you hear something now. I can hear something. It's warming up. I think it'll be okay. You do? There it comes. Yep. Yay. <laughs> as, as, as you fade in. <laughs> that way. Sorry. <laughs> Great picture. Did you know? Did you know they closed down today? <laughs> did they? I did yeah, not. They did. For the hurricane, yes. So I now have a presentation. My name is John Evans again. Thank you so much for the opportunity to present to you this evening. And to tell you a little bit about uh, Keefe Technical School, which is a public school option for the students in Hopkinton and for other member towns. I'd like to begin by acknowledging uh, a couple of our school committee members from Hopkinton and assure you that you are well represented by Mia Crandall, who is a parent of five students who have all attended Keefe Tech, and Ruth Knowles, who is one of our original members for over 40 years, has been on our school committee. Um, so they have a great deal of enthusiasm and support for both their town and the students that we serve. I'd also like to uh, thank Dr. McLeod for her support in the support for students who are considering our form of education, our school district, and for th taking the time to get to know us and what we do. We think that having all of the eighth graders from Hopkinton tour last year was a wonderful opportunity um, for students who weren't otherwise considering us to take a look, take a closer look, and for students who still did not find what they were looking for at Keefe, they could leave with a different appreciation for what we do within the school that they didn't have before. So 
we really do appreciate that. Um, so for Keith Technical School, I've listed our mission page, but I just want to um, relay to you that when we present our district to prospective students, families, and communities, we try to highlight that what we do is unique in terms of career and technical education. That really is what makes us different. And for students to have the opportunity to select a career and technical area to specialize in for three and a half years after exploring is what is unique about our district. But we also focus on the fact that by coming to our district, they are not closing doors in terms of their academic opportunities beyond high school. And we also provide our students with a full high school experience. So to give you a little bit more details about who we have, so our, our enrollment is growing um, a little bit each year and has been for the last few years. We are up nine students to 718. And for the town of Hopkinton, we are up from 16 students to 22. So Hopkinton is our smallest um, town in terms of enrollment, but um, we're so pleased that that number is growing. And I think when you go from 16 to 22, that looks like an incredibly large increase that we'll talk about at budget season with the increase in students, but it's six kids. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but we're very pleased uh, the support that we have from the schools, um, starting with Dr. McLeod down through the guidance counselors who are talking with students. Um, and we still want to continue to take the opportunity to get the word out to the community about who we are because I think there are still a number of parents who are not considering us who might not know all they need to about our choice. Um, and I would venture a guess that there are some students in this wonderful high school who would be well served by Keefe Tech, but they're in a great place. But um, we want to make sure everybody who could benefit at least takes a good look at Keefe. In terms of our enrollment, we do have 44% of our students on IEPs, and we have 65% of our students who qualify for free or reduced lunch in terms of our demographic. These are our career and technical programs. Um, for these programs, our grade nine students will get to know a little bit about each of them, and then they will select eight of these 16 programs that they want to learn more about. And in each of those eight programs, the students will spend a week um, for a half day, where the other half of the day is academics, and they will spend a whole week of mornings or afternoons in eight different programs, alternating with a full academic week. So at the end of 16 weeks, our students will actually select their career and technical uh, program that they will go into, and would like to think that they would select it and stay with it, but if we made a choice that needs to change, we can do that along the way too, because they're 14 years old and <laughs> we support them when they do. Um, but this, our career exploratory program really does give students an opportunity to learn more um, about each of these programs. For some of these programs, students are leaving with a head start on a career. When you look at electrical or plumbing, our students are leaving with 1,500 apprenticeship hours. They could be leaving with a cooperative education job and a real head start on a career. When you look at cosmetology, our students who reach the age of 16 can begin counting hours and can leave with the 1,000 hours needed to sit for a license so they could actually go off to work in that, in that career that they've chosen. Health careers, our students leave with a certificate in Alzheimer's care, certified nursing assistant, first aid, and CPR. Um, if they want to go on to an advanced medical career, an RN program, physical therapy, or what have you, um, they have a head start, and as I say, they know how to make a bed while somebody's in it. So they have practical knowledge and they, and they learn um, an actual practical setting and working with people in the community. So for each of these programs, we try to highlight as much actual experience that we can, and we try to prepare students for a bridge uh, to their future in one of these areas or to college with a head start in that area. In terms of our academic program, um, we have a full college prep program. We have an honors curriculum. We have students who are taking college courses in dual enrollment. And this year, for the first time, we've kicked off AP courses. So we have two sections of literature and one section of, it's really technology. So three AP courses at Keefe, something that we're very pleased with. We had Senator Spilka, uh, Representative Santa Candro, and Walsh over to celebrate with us as we began these programs. And our students will have uh, the opportunity to really challenge themselves in a competitive academic program. It's important to us that people who don't know us well know that in addition to our career and tech programs, there really is a competitive academic program at Keefe. Um, and as you'll see in the next slide, I think on the bottom, jumping ahead, 65% of our graduates from the class of 2016 went on to post-secondary education. 
So it really is um, inaccurate to perceive that you're closing the door on college if you come to Keefe Tech. And a lot of the other 35% of our students are going on quite successfully in careers where they will earn an income quickly, will not have college debt, and will go um, in a different type of successful direction. So we celebrate all of that for our students. In terms of um, MCAS, we follow the same requirements that other high schools in Massachusetts do. We are a level two school this year. Last year we were a level one school, primarily due to a number of um, significant increases in language arts. Um, we are a level two school this year, but the thing that pleases me the most is that in terms of student growth, we have met or exceeded all of our targets for all of our populations with the exception of one, and that is in math for students on an IEP where the goal was 50.5 and our students were 50, so very mm. close. Mm. But um, our students really do come to us and move forward and we're pleased with that. And for the last number of years that I can remember, we've had all of our students earn a competency determination and, and leave with the credentials they need to get a diploma. Uh, beyond the school day, it's important to us to give students the opportunity to participate in extracurricular, co-curricular activities. Um, NHS, as something was mentioned by our student council, who did a great presentation. Um, but we have a lot of the same things that you will see in other schools. Over the years, we've really invested in opportunities for students to kind of get a full high school experience. In my time working at Keefe over the last 20 years, uh, when I was in guidance and we've been in an auditorium, people would say, do you have lacrosse? Do you have drama? Do you have a golf team? Whenever the answer was no and enough kids asked, we tried to organize. And we've really grown um, our athletic programs to 18. Uh, we have a no-cut policy, so any student who qualifies in terms of MIAA rules who's coming to practice and comporting themselves as a student athlete should, uh, can be part of a team. And students have the opportunity to have a full high school experience by coming to our school. Um, and I wanted to tell you a little bit about it. I wanted to give you my information if ever you have additional information, if you'd like to see our school. Um, well, John, you did make a, a very nice invitation that you could extend publicly here. I'd be happy to. Um, yeah. Either, um, if you're interested in learning more about our school, to come join us in our East Side Room restaurant, and I'd be happy to show you around the school. Or if ever the Hopkinton School Committee wish to have a meeting at Keefe Tech, we'd be happy to host it um, for your business as a school committee as well to really uh, let you know about this great resource within the South Middlesex District. I would highly recommend the tour and the lunch. lunch. It's <laughs> excellent. <laughs> excellent. So thank you for the invitation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank we you appreciate your support. Thank you very much. Okay. okay. Um, the next item on our agenda is liaison reports. So I don't know who had meetings, who didn't have meetings. We can start at that end of the table. <laughs> I can give a quick update about the charter. We, um, I think I, I reported at our last meeting that we had had our um, our public forum and so we're now undertaking the work of incorporating all the feedback that we've gotten from the public and from all of the town boards and committees and um, started the work of building suggested revisions to the charter so that will be ongoing and then we're still waiting to hear about um, the confirmation of the special town meeting but the target date again is February 13th um, so that's that and we'll talk about the other big one as a separate agenda item, right? Uh, the Irvine Tadaro Property Committee met, and uh, the they very much liked the letter that we had sent on and wanted to extend a thank you to all of us, and Lori in particular. They found it helpful to have that out like that. The survey did close that was online and did get um, a little over, under 300 participants, which is, you know, in keeping with what other town, the sidewalk survey and some others got for responses, but the bus parking lot was rated unfavorably in terms of that people had to rate one to four by a large percentage. So they felt a design flaw in the way the survey was done could be that people didn't understand uh, the cost savings. There was no explanation for what it was so that that would be something that we should uh, take into account that it may need some public uh, information and education going forward. We're going to make a presentation to the selectmen at the, their first meeting in November 
to update on our progress and we're going to continue to solicit input from the community so it's certainly not the conversation is still going on ESPC has not had a meeting since our last meeting but I will take the opportunity to once again plug October 28th as our groundbreaking for the new school anybody who's I was I was away this week and came back to find a lot of work being done yeah, over the there trees. Trees <laughs> a done. lot fewer trees than were there when I left yeah. so it's it's really exciting to see the progress and looking forward to that at the end of the month any updates then? And I don't have any updates either since our last meeting. There hasn't been another CPAC meeting. Um, so I, I guess we can move on to the chair report. Um, first item of the chair report will be to talk about our executive session minutes. So at tonight's school committee meeting, we held an executive session just a few minutes ago for the purpose of reviewing past executive session minutes and in accordance with Mass General Law Chapter 30A, Section 22, I will now indicate the minutes we reviewed and the actions taken on the minutes of the following executive sessions. For the March 10th, 2016 executive session, the committee voted not to release the minutes due to Due to the fact that the release of such minutes may negatively impact negotiations in relation to the collective bargaining agreement with the HTA, um, the June 16th, 2016 minutes, the committee voted to release those. The August 18th, 2016 minutes, the committee also voted to release. And the September 8th, 2016 minutes, the committee voted to release. Um, my other item that I wanted to discuss with the committee since we're all together tonight um, is that the Board of Selectmen, and I know Jean brought this to my attention because I wasn't aware that we were put on the agenda for the Board of Selectmen's meeting on Tuesday, this past Tuesday, um, but it became it known to any of us way in too late for us to post a meeting or even find out who was available, um, which both the chair and the town manager apologized for the process not being followed and not getting us notification and had asked whether or not any of us can make the meeting on October 18th. Um, my understanding of what the meeting purpose is is to just have a discussion on what the budget guidelines are going to be. Um, there isn't anything any of us have to prepare for other than just to go there and be able to ask questions. What um, I didn't hear from everybody. I did hear from Jean. I know you had a meeting at 7:30. It's looking like, if I look at uh, when I looked at the agenda timeline that they had, it looked to me like it would be somewhere in the 8:30 day, 8:45 time frame that the meeting was going to have our portion of it. Um, I actually will be traveling that week. I'm, I won't be here for our school committee meeting, and I won't be able to make it there. I'll be on the west coast. Um, Mr. Herr did ask that if none of the school committee members were able to attend, if we would be okay with Dr. McLeod speaking on our behalf um, and asking questions on our behalf. So I just wanted to be able to have a brief discussion with you all to get your comfort level on how you'd like to proceed with this because um, I know I personally can't be there. So I'm just checking in with everybody and what they'd like to do. So I'm, I'm away as well. Um, I think I, we discussed that, uh, but recognizing that the timeline, I mean, we're going to be starting our budget process probably sooner than we could even postpone a discussion even further with them. So uh, it's not ideal, but um, I guess, yeah, yeah, I think that would be, I think that would be our best option. I do have a conflict, but I will just not go to the other meeting because obviously this is a priority um, and they've already missed the first two or three targets on their revised schedule so I certainly don't want to delay that process any further so I, I, can, I can absolutely be there I just was hoping I could do both things and if I can't then I'll do this one yeah I mean I I apologize because I certainly don't want to make anyone change their plans no, no. Um, it, I, I don't I don't think there's any preparation I think it's more going to be us listening and obviously Jean you've been through the budget process many times so you know the questions to ask so I, I certainly would appreciate um, I don't know, Doctor. I didn't know what your availability was either, and I wouldn't speak for you because I know you have some other um, family things going on. So your timeline was up in the air as well. So, um, so if that works, 
that Jean, you're able to attend. That'd be great. If anyone else is able to attend and I wants to there. go with Jean, you're more than welcome. If we have three members there, we will have to post. So we'll just need to keep that in mind. Um, but if three members aren't going to be there, then we don't have to post for it. So this is the this is the like the budget message. Should, yes, should be should be the yeah. budget message meeting. Okay. But I think that they have not actually. My understanding is they ended up not talking about it on Tuesday, so I don't know that they've actually set the calendar. You know the calendar that, that they were discussing with us and I don't know if that's because the appropriations committee didn't post and we didn't post for our meeting so they probably had to postpone the entire discussion to the 18th but I think that's also why he was pushing for the 18th because that was their next meeting and to try and keep them on schedule as much as possible yeah yeah, yeah. um so because I also asked well <laughs> could we have the discussion at our next meeting that didn't that didn't get responded to as um positively so um which I understand I mean it's part of their it's part of their agenda so but I was trying to find alternatives because I knew that we had some conflicts but um so if that does work for you both to go I would appreciate it and and certainly it'll be an experience for Nancy to experience and Jean will have done it before <laughs> so Kelly I didn't are you available? I am available, but if it's so a should pain we to post, post it's then not a no it's not a pain to post okay. it's on my calendar so, so it's on my calendar too Okay. Um, and I was just going to ask the same question Trust because I'll make sure that it gets posted. Um, I'll make sure that Megan posts. Well, I mean, in the abundance of caution, just posting anyway. And if something happens that night and someone can't attend, we're still okay because sure. he covered. posted. Yeah. So. And I'll post it for a window of 8 to 9. So yeah, is it okay to look at the agenda and come closer to when we're on it? Or Absolutely. do you think mm -hmm. they're going to yeah. Say, yeah. Just take it out of order? And, <laughs> oh, no, they no won't do here. that. They won't Probably. do that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Certainly. I, and I'll watch on TV. They will not no. watch so, on TV and race <laughs> over. I right. will certainly have the agenda ahead of time. Usually we can see it online. the Thursday or Friday before, but I can ask Brian to kind of give us a heads up on the timing. I, I don't know about putting the time on it. Kathy, I might just set it for the time of the meeting, and then that way, when anyone so gets covered, there, we're okay. Covered. And yeah, so we're really attending their meeting. That's what we're yeah. going right. To say. And so, for minutes purposes, when it's another meeting that we're attending, we we aren't required to do minutes unless we um, have a discussion or make a decision. So there, there's there's specifics in the open meeting law on this particular point because we ha I had to look it up a couple times so you certainly can take notes Nancy and if some major discussion happens then yes we would post minutes for it but otherwise we're not required to okay. so um, okay great so that was the other thing I just wanted to discuss live because it would be much easier um, and that was all I had in my chair report because I actually have received no correspondence believe it or not I mean we're we have an agenda item to talk about the other item I would talk about anyway so we um, don't need to go into it now so I'll give it to you Dr. McLeod thank you um, I wanted to begin um, I think to follow up on the students talking about the football field and there had been a lot of conversation a lot of um, public input as well as a lot of communication um, from the school department in terms of what we were doing to address not only immediately so there were two sections right we looked at what are we doing immediately to get our kids on the field as soon as possible and then what are we doing long term um, to prevent anything similar happening and we're going to be talking much more about the second part of this conversation as we begin our budget meetings um, but I did want to address you know there, there's always perception um, one of the things that we wanted to do right away uh, was get the kids on fields that they were able to play on safely. And the Parks and Recreation Department uh, approached us um, to work with us collaboratively to seek a solution. One of the things that came out of it, and, and I was delighted to, to learn, was that we can partner with them and um, find a way that would benefit both parks and recreation and the school department and in this sense a solution that was offered was to rent temporary lighting that would increase not only the numbers of games that we could play on on the fields but also um, that parks and rec would also be able to extend their hours and then in, and then as a result um, increase rentals one of the things that was misunderstood I think in that discussion was the cost piece and so what we negotiated with Parks and Rec was that we would share the cost of the lighting um, because we were quoted, a, and I, I was invited to one of their meetings, and we were quoted a cost that was per month. So what we ended up doing is agreeing 
to the, basically the cost of the lighting would be equivalent to what we would have otherwise had to pay in rental to the fields and waiving the rental fee uh, charge. Um, I think it's an example of departments working collaboratively together and I felt really supported um, by the Parks and Rec Department and learned and came to understand more clearly that there are people that have already um, negotiated with them to rent their fields and in this case it was youth soccer who is their th therefore their first their fir they get to get the hours first and we we needed to work around that um, so I wanted to just basically comment on that to thank Parks and Rec to thank youth soccer for working with our AD D King to collaborate and find times when the kids could play so I think soccer has been playing Field hockey has been there. Has I think soccer mostly was there? field hockey plays okay. there. Soccer has been on field 13, but they're mm -hmm. going to have some games over there, yeah. too. So yeah. And I want to stress that this is, that this is a solution for this season only. This is not something we're looking to partner in, in a long-term solution. It, it was really um, an, an emergency situation that we wanted to address this year's season so that our kids could play. Um, and as far as funding source, that's exactly why we have revolving accounts. It's the unexpected, and we've talked about this. Um, that's why those monies are there, so that when the unexpected occurs, we have a, a revenue source. So any questions on that? I just wanted to kind of circle back as we move on to uh, not talking. In, well, we talk in turf in a, in <laughs> later, but it's unrelated. I don't have any questions, but yeah. just I, I, as an opportunity to highlight, I know you mentioned her, but D. King, who had been on the job for all of three weeks when this whole thing started, I thought has shown just tremendous leadership tremendous right leadership. off the bat. And I think it's worth um, highlighting because I know I've been impressed and I've heard many, many parents express how impressed they are as well. So clearly an asset. Thank you. How did the football field hold up to having a game on it? Well, I was there and uh, <laughs> I was uh, hoping that it wouldn't be a mud bath and yeah, it wasn't. Yeah. No, it, 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 it held up very well and I thought it might be uh, really slippery but it, it it was it was great okay I, yeah good <laughs> and it's continuing to progress it is continuing to prog progress and I met with Al and Ashok just before this meeting tonight to talk about um, the implications for uh, you know ongoing maintenance going forward from from this turf specialty company um, recommending some things that that we did that in the end it was a great solution um, and we want to be able to have that in place way earlier on going forward. So um, the other thing that there has been some interest in, as always at this time of the year, as we approach October, past October 1st, is enrollment. And um, I just wanted to report briefly, and then, of course, there'll be a much more detailed report as part of our budget um, planning, that overall K-12, pre-K-12, we have an additional 20 students beyond NESDEC projections, right? That's across the district with the ins and the outs. And not surprisingly, the most, the, the biggest difference was at kindergarten. Um, however, between, between 20 additional students in kindergarten and then 10 fewer students, fewer than NESDEC projection. I just want to reinforce that I'm not talking about necessarily fewer than last year. I'm talking about fewer than NESDEC projection. Um, ended up that center had an additional 10 students, middle school an additional nine over projection, um, three fewer actually at the Elmwood school, um, two fewer at the high school than NESDEC projection. So as we've been saying all along, when we talk about it being flat, we're just, we're not talking about flat growth. We're talking about overall increase in enrollment is, is you know, ebbing and flowing, mm -hmm. but overall, um, the, the, the projections continue to be um, a great yardstick for us to use to make decisions. Can I ask just a question to Please. follow up on that? Is it's 20, only 20 over NESDEC projections? I don't have the sure. projections, but what is that over compared to last year? So they had 224 students additional this year, and the NESDEC projection was 204. Nancy, because I don't have the previous year, I have first grade. If you had asked me about any other grade, I would have been able to answer that question. I don't know what it was compared to last year. I, but total in the district, district. though, what is the, the 
Do you know what the difference in enrollment between last year and this year is? Right, 20. For the whole district? For the district, correct. I know. Okay. It, so, so 20 it, in, the, in the kindergarten, but then 10 fewer in first grade. So the difference between what NESDEC projected for this year and what actually happened was 20. Correct. They projected 3,443, and we currently have 3,463. Okay. So we have 20 additional students in the district pre-K through 12. I think the, th the thing we'll have to keep a watch on is it's not necessarily surprising, even though we're, I think, in the th second or third year of it, that that we're going to be, NESDEC is going to miss high on first grade because we've traditionally, yes. when we didn't have full day kindergarten, had a big spike in first grade. Yeah. So that may be working its way through the model. Right. And so that that may be something that we have to keep an eye on. It may right. not offset itself as much in mm -hmm. future years. Mm -hmm. That's true. I mean, you know, again, we'll talk about this during when we have our budget reports, but we're certainly not at all happy with our class size in those younger grades. But we all know there's nowhere to put them right now. So. Um, I can pass this down to you, Nancy, so you can see the actual spreadsheet. Oh, if you thank like. you. Okay. Do we have, I, I didn't know you were going to be doing this, so I didn't know to ask. Do we have any idea how the Legacy Farm is doing against? Yes, we do have that number, and um, we got it just from Linda Henderson recently. I don't know if you were copied. Mm -hmm. So she keeps that really nice spreadsheet, and I will get the exact number for our next meeting, but we're still under, I want to say by about 200 students. Oh, okay. Under what the Legacy Yes, under the agreement. At full build out mm -hmm. would be. Mm -hmm. When NESDEC made the projections, did they take into account the new uh, apartments that are going in down by 77 West Main? They knew about those, yes. Yeah, yeah a couple of years ago, here. we really went back multiple times we with did. them to okay. push them on some of these models. And they models, just, so. just today asked yeah. us for this year's numbers. So they're, they're working on getting Good. us an updated projection, um, and that would include any any updates so that's great yeah. thank you very much sure and that's my report great thank you dr mcleod welcome and dr kavanaugh you get to join us this, e <laughs> this evening <laughs> and we can't wait to see the district performance report yes so it's actually quite celebratory i think that hopkinton has an awful lot to be proud of so i have sort of uh, develop this so that it works vertically so that we start with center school and we end at the high school and I didn't want to make it simply an MCAS report because as you know center school doesn't have any MCAS scores and I think that we're doing other things that transcend really what the MCAS sort of dictates for us but our scores are so good that they certainly warrant a look so <laughs> um, so I'm beginning with center school and um, we have a huge literacy um, shift going on in center school right now so that we have um, different programs one is foundations every kid gets foundations and we have found us in Pinnell guided reading and benchmark assessment system data so when they do their BAS testing we are keeping data on every kid and looking for growth and achievement um, one of the really um, fabulous things that is happening right now is that we are bringing on a literacy coach it's grant funded and we have actually been very fortunate to hire someone who is highly credentialed and she will be working in center school and Elmwood school so that she's working directly with teachers as a coach and um, hopefully they'll be able to take that BAS data and then translate that into really targeted instruction. Uh, the third thing that's happening at Center is we have the SRSD, which is Self-Regulated Strategy Development Writing. They actually had all of their training on that last year, and so the presenter is coming back for a couple of days this year just to do a refresher. But I was at Center School the other day doing walkthroughs, and I happened upon a kindergarten classroom where they were actually doing that foundational writing. So it was pretty exciting what was happening in there. And then by the time we get to the end, I'll talk a little bit about the new science curriculum, but embedded in those science standards um, is the notion that kids should be doing a lot of literacy work in the science classroom. So hopefully we'll be working on curriculum that will also involve some reading and writing. And the rationale for that is very simple. We really want this balanced literacy plan where kids are reading, getting targeted instruction, um, getting phonics, doing um, really solid writing, and doing writing in content areas. So here is a crowning moment. When we get to the grade three ELA scores from last spring, you can take a look at that and see that in the past four years, those are our highest ELA scores in terms of achievement.
and the math. The math is really astounding. Look at how many students in grade three scored advanced on the math MCAS test. Great. So when you have 64% of your kids scoring advanced, that's pretty good. Um, and really, we also have 25% there who are also proficient. So you know, it's about 89, 90% yes. of our kids who, I mean, that's astounding. Remarkable. So a lot to be celebrated there. Um, I did outline all of those celebrations, and I know you have already sort of done the math. The only piece that you didn't see on the last slide was that, um, and this may come as a byproduct of the SRSD writing that also happened at Elmwood last year, but students who are identified as Title I, when we looked at just at their open response question writing scores, those scores more than doubled for Title I students. So we're hoping that that kind of trend continues with the SRSD writing. And it's worth mentioning that that was introduced at the Elmwood School last year. So this SRSD writing approach has been now, this will be the third year at Center School. It was introduced last year. At Elmwood. At Elmwood, right. And so um, it's just worth mentioning that we have those kinds of results. We do. And this year it's happening at Hopkins and right. at the middle school. So kids will be taught to write in a consistent language all the way from K to 8. So this is what we call the accountability data. And there are two lines that are important. And the two lines that are important are the ones that say all students and high need students. In order for a school to be ranked level one, both of those numbers have to hit the red dot at 75%. And so you can see that all students did in fact meet the target and high need students did not in fact meet the target. And when we talk about high need students, that's comprised of students who are socioeconomically disadvantaged, students who are English language learners, and students who have diagnosed disabilities or kids who are on individual ed plans. But what I kind of like about this is that we can now sort of see that gap and know where we need to work. Elmwood is doing many of the same things that Center is doing, and we're really pleased with that because kids are getting that consistency in, um, in the vertical articulation moving from K to 3. And as you'll see in a minute, the same things are taking place at Hopkins as well. Um, one of the things that's very exciting about uh, the work that's being done here at Elmwood is the LLI, the um, level literacy intervention. So if we find that we have kids who are real struggling readers, they will get that um, LLI instruction. So um, one of the things that we did was we went through the MCAS test and we thought about where are places that our kids, although they did very well, that they could do better. And this is an example of, of one of those problems. So in this particular problem, you can see by the question based on paragraphs two to four, what does the diagram mainly show? Kids were given two different texts. They were given a diagram and they were given prose. And they had to make meaning between the two of those. Even though our scores are above state average, they're not as high as we would like them to be. So another thing that's happening at Elmwood is I am meeting with the CTLs, the curriculum leaders there among the teacher ranks, and we are thinking about putting together text sets so the kids have an opportunity to see how complementary texts work. And in terms of math instruction, you can, I mean, we have a very targeted plan there. So that very first problem, only 44% of our kids got that one right. And if you look at the one on the right, 64% of our kids got that one right. The first one, it may just be a reading issue because most of the kids picked D for that one. So instead of finding an expression that equaled 16 and having gone with two times eight, they went immediately to the bottom because they just looked at the numerical values of the numbers in the parentheses. You know what's funny is I just did the I same thing. Exact same thing. <laughs> exact same thing. Uh, I was like, is this a trick question? <laughs> yep. It kind of no, is no. a trick question. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? When you, when you said most of them picked D, I was like, well, what's wrong with that? <laughs> 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 like, uh, and 100% yeah. of the school committee got it They don't have MCAS, it work. Mm, no. And you can see what they've done with the other one is they have simply inverted the traditional order. And so those things are easy to remedy. The third thing that we identified is line plots. 
And um, Aidan McCann is really a math guru, the new assistant principal at, at Elmwood. And he and I will agree that as sure as the sun comes up tomorrow morning, there will be a line plot on every grade three, four, and five <laughs> MCAS test with varying uh, degrees of difficulty. So we're working on them. All right, so here are the Hopkins grade four ELA scores. <clears throat> Again, they are looking better. Yep, there's certainly improvement there. And if we had a goal there, it would be really nice to move some of those kids who are proficient into the advanced column. So Dr. Kavanaugh, what I've noticed in all of these charts is that the numbers are wonderful and like the percentage that are advanced and proficient, but it seems that year to year our numbers that are warning or failing stay exactly the same. So in some cases that, I mean, I guess if we look at the 2015 scores, there were 28% of those kids and this year it was down to 19. Um, and I think you'll be really impressed when you see the middle school ones. I think that's yeah. consistent. I mean, we're seeing, we're seeing a reduction because that's where my eyes go right away is what's going on with warning and warning yeah. and failure. Right. We're seeing some consistent reduction. If you saw, if you looked at the third grade as well. Yeah, I mean, I guess like the warning failing one is where I'm seeing like not a lot of movement. Obviously, you're getting movement from the needs improvement range because obviously it has to be coming from somewhere. Oh, so. I see warning failing. Uh -huh. But just in terms of these charts, right? I, mean, I think so we these... ask this every year though. But like the 2016 grade four is not being compared to the 2015 grade three. It's different it's kids. Four, yeah, they're four, always four, different kids, four. right? Correct. It's not cohort. So no. it's the it's not cohort. Just making sure that we understand. Yep. Okay. Right. And so the one score that will show that are the SGPs or the student growth percentile scores. Mm. So for example, if you looked at the, the math scores, and I debated really keeping those SGP scores in for Hopkins, and here's why. So if you were a third grader last year, you were in cohort groups with only 50% of the kids in the state because the other 50% took PARC. So then if you were moved from third grade to fourth grade this year, only 28% of the kids took the MCAS test because 72% took PARC. So that cohort group got so small that I don't think that the data is reliable. If we look at like grade eight scores, it's much more reliable and grade 10 scores is perfectly reliable because that's the only competency determination. There is no PARC for grade 10 is what I'm saying. And I guess when we look at those um, warning scores and they go from two to seven to five to two, um, somehow those are scores that, you know, I mean, it would be ideal if they stayed sort of in that two range and never went up to seven. But I'm not necessarily sure that we find places that actually eliminate all students from getting to that place mm -hmm. or landing in that place. I mean, it's... You know, it's something that we work at all the time, and we certainly have all kinds of targeted programming. Um, but that's, I would say, if you looked at other districts statewide, those numbers are actually very, very good. Yeah. Yeah. And so the Hopkins grade five scores, there's very little change here. That's kind of consistent. We've talked however um every year when it comes this time that it takes time for that effect to ripple up and you're you're seeing it in the third grade um results and so i'm anticipating right that that strong start that's happening is going to be moving up as well as you know working we've been talking a lot about working from both ends and so i think that that's part of what we're seeing here in the hopkins school that the, those students haven't reached that grade level yet yes and what's interesting about these grade five um and I, I probably should have left these in the grade five math if we looked at the sgp scores for all of the kids who are regular education students the sgp scores were on average in the 60s so that's very good because anything above 60 is considered to be high impact on student achievement but the very interesting thing is that the score for kids who are um, on IEPs was in the 70s. 
So, I mean, that was astounding. Wow. For, it was for grade four was in the 70s, grade five was in the 60s. For both groups, which is really unusual to have kids who are regular ed and special ed have the same growth percentile scores. So that's something that's really amazing that's happening there. And even though it doesn't look great here in terms of the achievement of these kids compared to the kids who were there in the fourth, fifth grade before them, the growth that they've made from fourth grade to fifth grade as a cohort group is really astounding. And the science scores are just about, you know, sort of where they were um, consistent. So these are some of the Hopkins celebrations. Grade four really does have its best overall scores in the past four years. And even though, again, 78% of grade five students were proficient or above in math, and we'd like that number to be a little higher, they have great growth. So again, we have the Hopkins accountability data. And again, we would like for those numbers to get to 75 in both the high needs and in all students. They are super close right now with all students. And one thing that you don't see in this is that if you looked at last year's high needs number, um, it would have been sort of egregiously low. So the work that they are doing with students who are high needs at Hopkins um, isn't really reflected here, but that number has gone up significantly. And I think that um, their literacy work in Fountas and Pinnell, the guided reading, the BAS data collection, the LLI interventions, all of those things are helping. And right now they are working on SRSD. So that's what the teachers are focused on now is really thinking about writing. And the kind of writing that they do with SRSD is tied to reading. So I think that they're gonna get a lot of bang for their buck too in, in reading growth as well as in writing growth. And one of the things that they do with math is they have the Envision math, but for students who need remediation, they get Jump Math as a remedial tool. All right, so why SRSD? Uh, I'm not a person who believes ever that um, testing should drive the kind of teaching that we do, but one of the things that we are seeing with writing, whether it's SAT writing or um, any kind of standardized testing or even just the kind of writing that the mass new ELA frameworks from 2011 are asking kids to do is to have more attention to informational text because for years all we did was we had kids read fiction and write about fiction and read fiction and write about fiction without thinking about a lot of the reading that happened in social studies or science. So the SRSD does help very much with the informational text and if you just look at these two pieces right here um, these are both grade four and five MCAS questions. One of them asks students to read a biography, and then the question is, a creative person is someone who uses imagination to come up with new ideas. Based on the article, explain why John Kovac could be called a creative person. Support your answer with important information from the article. So they're working with a biography. And in the second one, kids had to read um, two different genres. So they were reading an article and a folk tale, and they had to talk about how fear can affect people based on what those two things said. So they are trying to make meaning between texts, and just like we saw in the third grade one, we're seeing the same thing in a fifth grade one. All right, but this is the highlight of the show now when we get to the middle school. Oh my goodness, it's overwhelming. So we can take a look at their ELA results for the spring. And as you're looking at that, you're thinking, well, they look just like last year's. And in some ways, they do look just like last year's. Um, the math, you can see, has gone up quite a bit. The ELA in grade seven, you can see that we now have 36% and 57%. So if we looked at those proficient numbers from last year and thought, how do we push kids to advanced, um, they have successfully done that. And there's one of those rarities where in 2016, not a single kid was in the warning failing. The math is outrageously wonderful again. 51% of the kids are advanced. ELA, you can see we have very good scores there again. 
and the math, 63% of them were advanced, so those are amazing scores. And the science, again, is sort of just consistent with, well, actually, there's a, a good jump in the advanced scores. But here's the very exciting part. For the very first time, the middle school is a level one school. They have started to close that achievement gap. And when I talked to Alan Keller about it, he said, you know, I've really been grappling with this for a very long time. I started to wonder, do I need to teach to a test, or do I just really need to think about good old-fashioned solid instruction? And he went with the latter, and he got the results. And I think that that's phenomenal. But wait, there's more. Mm -hmm. If you look at this data, and there's all kinds of things going on there, what they'll do is they'll break down every group um, into ELLs, into gender, into high needs, into socioeconomically disadvantaged, all of those groups. If you go to the next to last column where they show us the median SGP, anything above 60 is considered to be high impact on student achievement. If we look at the average middle school SGP ELA score, every single one of those scores for every single subgroup is above 60. That's phenomenal. That is something to be exceedingly proud of. That, I mean, Alan should feel great about that. And the math? It's goose bumpy. <laughs> it's goose bumpy. <laughs> so if you do the same thing, you go to the median SGP score for the math, um, not only are they all above 60, but there are a couple of places where they exceed 70. So those kids are making incredible growth from year to year. It's so good, isn't it? Yeah, mm -hmm. that's excellent. Girls are higher than the boys on both of them. Did you notice? I didn't notice that. I did notice yeah, that, okay. yeah. <laughs> All right, and then we move to the high school. Um, this is just you know another one of those rankings that puts um, Hopkinton High School 14th in Massachusetts. I think if you saw the Best of Boston that was just recently released, it's 31st. Um, but that means that you know Hopkinton's always in the top 5%, 10% statewide. The ELA and math scores always tend to jump when you get to the high school level because that's the place where kids are getting their competency determination. So it tends to be a, um, a test that is sort of a baseline kind of test. I mean, certainly it's more difficult than the eighth grade test, but um, it's not like the kind of test that is designed to um, sort of hold students back, but rather to just make sure that they have the competency to earn a diploma in the state of Massachusetts. Um, that's not to say that the high school teachers aren't doing a great job, but you can see how high the advanced numbers are here. And the math is wonderful as well. And there's the biology scores. Those are our scores that are not easily achieved. Um, when we think about these biology scores, to have 70% of your kids advanced is amazing statewide. And the other thing is that this is really sort of a language-based science. So kids have a lot of science contest, content, but there's also a whole lot of reading and writing that happens there. So both pieces are there, the literacy pieces and the, the science pieces. All right, and again, the high school is a level one school. It has sort of historically been. And these are the high school SGP scores for ELA and math. Um, if we look at the median SGP, those are pretty good SGP scores right there. Students on IEPs were at 54%, but anything above 50 is something to be pleased about, and anything above 60 is something to be very pleased about. And look at the math. The, st the growth for students with IEPs was actually exceeded that um, of regular education students. That's a nice thing to see in terms of targeting instruction over the years from eighth grade to 10th grade. All right, and this is close to the end. I just wanted to tell you a little bit about the new science standards because I'm sure that people uh, in the district are wondering how are we doing with the implementation of them. 
So these were adopted by the state in January. The state released them officially in April. I mean, we knew this was coming for quite a long time. And you can see that there's a timeline there. So for the spring of 17, the assessments are going to be based on the old standards. Currently, we are in a place where we are thinking about how to best implement the new standards so that there aren't gaps in student learning. And so that when a student, for example, takes a science MCAS in grade five, we're sure that they have hit all the standards that they need to hit in that K to five, um, line, in that K to five continuum so that they are appropriately prepared in, in grade five. Um, in the 17-18 year, so in the spring of 2018, what they're gonna do is take the old standards and the new standards and see which, which standards are common. And kids will only be tested on the common standards between the old and the new. And then in the spring of 2019, we will be fully tested on the new standards. So we have to have full implementation in place by the spring of 19. And I don't know if you have any other questions. I had a question just from reviewing my kids' sheets that came home this week. Mm. I noticed there was a line that talked about park questions. Yes. What was that? Was that just like a little, we'll see how they do on that type of question within the MCAS framework? It was, and I don't think it was until about December last year that they released the information to schools that for kids at the elementary, no, I think all the way to grade eight, there was going to be a writing to text task and it was going to be a response to narrative text. So while they had taken the long composition out of grade seven and grade four and everybody exhaled and said, oh, that's great, the next thing we knew was there was going to be you know, a writing to text task. They did say that those um, writing to text task scores were not going to count in your regular MCAS scores, but they would be reporting on how your student did on the composition and how your student did on any of the multiple choices. And then they were also going to embed in the math some park-like questions that would be there, and then they would report to you on that as well, but those questions would not um, impact your MCAS scores. Okay, I just thought that was interesting. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Sure. Did you see for the park was there any comparison on how kids did with the park questions versus the MCAS overall that in terms of if so I think in just sort of pulling some of the student reports they if a student was probably like middle proficient on those park ones they probably slipped to like low proficient and that may have just happened um, because of a lack of familiarity with those kinds of questions. Um, and that's why we're doing that thing where we are building text sets and where we're going back to those kinds of math problems where there's a lot of reading and math. Um, I've shown everyone my, my favorite um, park question, but one of them has a pictorial and the old algorithm, and it asks students not to solve this or solve that, but write about the relationship between the two. So that's a pretty typical park kind of question where you'd find a lot of writing and reading in the math classroom. So we're working toward those goals. Um, even though measured progress is um, the person who won the bid to create the MCAS 2.0, uh, Pearson is hired there as a subcontractor. So I'm thinking that. Um, where Pearson created PARC, there'll be some kind of PARC-like questions on our MCAS 2.0. And when will that be, the 2.0 be coming out? Uh, yeah, we're, we are at 2.0, this year. 2. This year. 0, okay. yeah. um, except for the high school. We will keep its competency determination until they let us know that they're ready to make the change. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Great. So, you. Um, not a question, but just we were talking about budget earlier and it yeah. comes to mind because one of the things that's come up a lot I think even in the past couple of years since we've initiated some larger programs like the kindergarten program like some of these different reading programs literacy coaches etc is questions from other committees and the town about what results are we driving mm -hmm. um, and you couldn't get a more compelling case than was there but obviously our audience is limited tonight <laughs> um so i would just say as we go through the budget process if we could think about how do we how do we even take that i mean there's so much great content it's going to be tough but almost shrink it down into a you know one or two slide highlight mm -hmm. so that when we do get that question 
because it does come up a lot and I think sure. it's and I think it's fair because we've made some significant investments but it's also fair for the district to say but look this is what we're getting out of it right. this is value for cost right there yes. I mean this this student growth is is very impressive so very. I just think it would be great for us to be prepared as we go into those discussions with some of those highlights to say these these investments that the town has made are really paying off in terms of student growth it's a great this is a great recommendation John and we'll be sure to do that thanks yeah yes, data is my favorite thing <laughs> <laughs> that came yeah. across I, yeah. <laughs> I, know it, it was, I know this was just shared publicly but again I, I agree with John I don't think we have a huge audience so is this going to be available on the website or yeah oh, I especially I mean I've been sitting here for a long time and that is amazing progress at the middle school I feel like we've talked a lot and tried a lot and put a lot of money and time and sweat and everything in, into that and that's just tremendous um, progress so uh, I like the fireworks I know <laughs> graphics that is very appropriate but I just want to make sure that this you know is shared more broadly with with the community because I think it's really good news yeah you don't think they're all watching at home um, well I'll, I'll echo that, Jean. It was a fabulous presentation, Carol. And I'm thinking that maybe we'll get a listserv out, letting people know it's there, especially since they just got the MCAS Very results. Right. I think sending out, a, a, you know, working with Linda tomorrow. Sure. And then we can post it. Typically, we post it right on the home page, and it shows up right as a as a banner, and then people can can watch your wonderful presentation. Yes. So. Thank you. And for the home audience, they can call the middle school and congratulate <laughs> them tomorrow. Right. Oh, oh, They'll oh, get two oh. calls. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, if you if you would like to um, excuse yourself, you are okay. most welcome to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Next up, we're into new business, and our first item is the turf field committee appointments with Mrs. Birchman and Mr. Graziano. Yes. So um, we had 15 people apply for five community spots, which was outstanding and um, very exciting. And then when we saw the applications and interviewed them, it was even more exciting and actually a little stressful because I mean it really was what I would call an embarrassment of riches it was there we just have some very talented um, experienced pro professional people in this community um, who are willing to volunteer their time so it was really really hard to narrow it down but um, but narrow it down we did so you have it in your packet I think did you get this this completed form no, this was in the again. yeah this was in the posted packet you might have opened the first packet which just had the emails yep. so I have the list so if you don't all have it I'll just quickly read the the names so um, John and I will represent the school committee Kathy McLeod is the superintendent principal Evan Bishop athletic director D King director of buildings and grounds Al Rogers member of the community with communications and marketing experiences John Schwartz a member of the community with athletic engineering and and or construction experiences Ed LaFleur a member of the community with experience in athletic facility administration is Amy Mick a member of the community knowledgeable in finance and capital projects is Jim Vallis. A member of the community at large is Kelly DePaolo. Member of the Board of Selectmen, Brian Herr. Member of the Appropriations Committee, Shahodul Manan. And a member of the Capital Improvement Committee is Jessica Shea. So um, that is our committee. We just need you all to officially vote on them tonight. Our first meeting is set for October 17th, where we'll get started. The town clerk will come and swear everybody in. And um, we're in the process of scheduling the feasibility study reports from Gail and Warner Larson. So uh, there's a lot of energy. People are really excited to get going. And um, I think it's going to be a really good group. Great. Yeah, all great. the bases covered in there. That's really cool. Yeah. And, and you know, all the bases covered, and I think at a depth that we weren't we really expecting. Not at all. I mean, all. Uh, the, some of the the I mean, again, some of the applicants we turned down. It was as Gene said, it was painful to turn them down. But I feel like this is really not not only an all star committee, but also it's nice to see you know some names that haven't maybe participated in some of these committees before mm -hmm. um, to to join this this effort. I think that that's really exciting as well. Mm -hmm. Nice. Great. So at this time, um, the recommended motion before us is 
we need someone to move to approve the appointments of the members of the turf field committee as outlined in the agenda materials. So moved. Second. Oh, you can have it since it's yours. <laughs> <laughs> Motion by Mrs. Birchman is seconded by Mr. Graziano. All those in favor? Yes. 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 Any opposed? No. no. It's unanimous and so carries. Thank you both. I know it was a lot of work to interview 15 people. <laughs> Um, Again, D. King did a great job and Lucy on board of organizing all of that. And um, she really, I don't know when she sleeps because between this and managing <laughs> all the fields and the sports, she's a, a busy, busy woman. Okay. So the next item on our agenda is in relation to the open meeting law complaint, which um, you're all aware that we received during our September 22nd regular scheduled meeting. The open meeting law complaint was filed by Mr. Gerald to it. Um, it was there. There's a description of the entire complaint in our agenda materials. Um, and so we have a couple items to go over, but first I have um, some discussion. So Mr. Tewitt's allegation was that based on emails that were sent between committee members or sent between committee members and Dr. McLeod, um, he alleged that there was a, a breach of open meeting law based on those emails being sent. Um, it's our position that there was no discussion and that there were uh, there were no decisions made over email but out of an abundance of caution um, and because there is nothing that the committee is trying to hide from the public we are I am going to read the emails out loud during this meeting for the public to hear um, and then after I have read through those emails we can discuss the um, proposed response to the complaint that will, if the committee approves, um, will be filed with the Attorney General's office tomorrow and will also be sent directly to Mr. Tewitt. Um, we are under a deadline. We have to respond by tomorrow. So if there, um, if there are changes, we'll need to make them immediately while we're here and agree on them, and then we will need to vote on what that response is. So just wanted to make you all aware um, of what the order of operations is. And we have two motions that will be before us. I know they're not in your agenda materials. We didn't have them in time to provide them, but I will read them aloud so that everyone is aware. But at this time, I'm going to read a series of seven emails into the record. I will not be reading the automated full email address headings or the automated signature sections. The first email was sent on September 9, 2016 from Mr. Tewitt to each of the five school committee members. It reads, hello, you may recall several months ago I asked for use of school facilities for a community lecture on the threat of New England to New England of radical Islam, Islamism. Dr. McLeod denied my request. I then appeared before the school committee asking for reconsideration. The committee did not reconsider. I would appreciate about 15 minutes of your time individually at your convenience to provide you information that you may not have. I wa also want to better understand why the committee objects to this use of school facilities. I considered alternatives to school use. In the end, I believe our school facilities are the proper and appropriate venue for a forum to educate our community on a vitally important issue. Please let me know if and when we might meet. Um, v slash R, Jerry Tewitt for Price Street. The second email was sent on September 9, 2016 from Mrs. Jean Birchman to the chair. Hi, Lori. I assume you got this as well and will respond on behalf of the committee, but I just wanted to make sure that it went to you. Thanks, Jean. The email included the text of the first email, i.e., Mr. Tewitt's September 9, 2016 email previously read. The third email 
was sent on September 9, 2016 from myself, the chair, to Jean Birchman. It just appeared in my inbox to welcome me to the weekend. Thanks for checking. This email included the text of the first email and the second email, i.e. the email from Mr. Tewitt and Mrs. Jean Birchman's email to the chair, read previously. The fourth email. The email was sent on September 9, 2016 from the chair to each of the other four school committee members. Subject, forward, school facility use, not for discussion, all caps. Please confirm with Kathy if you are in receipt of this email from Mr. Tewitt. We will plan to discuss during our next meeting. This email also included the text of the first email, i.e. the email from Mr. Tewitt to the chair previously read. The fifth email. Email was sent on September 13, 2016 from myself, the chair, to Mr. Tewitt. Mr. Tewitt, thank you for your email message. Unfortunately, I cannot take a meeting with you individually as this would be a violation of open meeting law under Massachusetts law. In addition, this is a matter that the school committee has already deliberated on during a regular meeting and we communicated our decision to deny the request via Dr. McLeod's email dated June 13, 2016. While I understand you are disappointed that your request was denied, the school committee has discretionary rights to restrict the use of its facilities. A resident's right to use school buildings for community events is not unlimited. Parentheses, Mass General Laws, Chapter 71, and parentheses. Best regards, Lori Nickerson, Chairperson, Hopkinton School Committee. This email also included the text of the first email previously read, i.e. the email from Mr. Tewitt to the chair previously read. The sixth email. Email was sent on September 13, 2016 from myself, the chair, to each of the other four school committee members. Subject forward, school facility use, all caps, not for deliberation or discussion. Please see my response to Mr. Tewitt. Should there be any need for discussion, we can do so as a committee during our next regular meeting on September 22nd. Thanks, Lori. This email included the text both of the first email and the fifth email previously read, i.e. the emails from Mr. Tewitt to the chair and from the chair to Mr. Tewitt. Seventh email. Email was sent on September 14, 2016 from Mrs. Jean Birchman to the chair. Thank you for sharing this, Jean. This email included the text of the first email, fifth email, and the sixth email previously read, i.e. both emails from Mr. Tewitt to the chair and the email from the chair to Mr. Tewitt. And that concludes the seven emails that we were reading aloud for the public's benefit. Um, we certainly can discuss the um, response to the complaint. The one thing I, I did want to notify the committee of is that um, also out of an abundance of caution, our council has provided us an advisory, um, which I have here for all of you today and will hand out in relation to um, group emails and also individual meetings with um, members of the community on matters that we may have already deliberated on. And one point I do just want to make about this that um, that you may or may not have already known based on your trainings in open meeting law, um, but that was somewhat surprising to me was the fact that um, if any of us take an individual meeting with a community member, which we all are able to do, and we express our opinion on some matter that may or may not have been before the school committee to that community member, and that community member then proceeds to go and take a meeting with more members of the committee. Their communication to you, whether or not you asked for it, about what the other committee member said can be an unintentional but technical violation of open meeting law. So the reason that we were advised not to individually meet on an item that we deliberated was that if Mr. Tewitt had met with each of us and had shared any information that another school committee member stated during their meeting with him, we would have automatically been violating open meeting law just by hearing it, even if you didn't ask for the information. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was the purpose in our denying the individual meetings. But that's 
so that just so that there's some clarity there and if there isn't clarity there we're certainly able to make um, council more available to any of that piece but I, I will pass out the advisory so you all have it if we have questions on it we certainly can either discuss it during our next meeting or we can discuss with council but um, individually but I just wanted you to be aware of that technicality um, and the reasoning behind us receiving the advice that we had when we were asked to individually meet with Mr. Tewitt. So at this time, I believe all of you were provided the response to the complaint. Um, we don't need to read it um, out loud because it will be in our agenda materials once I've signed it. Um, but if anyone had any concerns over the language or would like any changes made, now is the time for us to discuss it. I did not have any changes. I thought it was a thorough response that yeah. I'm, I'm comfortable mm -hmm. voting to approve. I think all your explanations have been very helpful, so thanks for that. Okay. So then at this time, I have two motions to put before the committee um, to recommend to the committee, and then someone can make a motion uh, on its behalf, and we, of course, need to second it and then vote on it. Um, they do not require a roll call vote. It's a regular vote, um, but I just, uh, I just apologize for you not having them before you to see them. Um, the first motion is... Um, with respect to open meeting law complaint filed by Mr. Gerald to it to authorize myself Lori Nickerson as chair for this committee to sign and forward the required response with attachments to the Attorney General by October 7 2017 such response to be in or substantially in the form submitted to this meeting so moved second motion by Mr. Graziano seconded by Ms. Knight all those in favor Yes. 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 None opposed. And it's unanimous and so carries. And our second motion this evening in relation to the open meeting law complaint is with respect to the open meeting law complaint filed by Mr. Gerald to it to authorize myself, Lori Nickerson, as chair for this committee to sign and forward the letter outlining the committee's remedial actions to the complainant on or before October 7, 2016, such letter to be in or substantially in the form attached to our agenda materials. So moved. Second. Motion by Mr. Graziano, seconded by Ms. Knight. All those in favor? Yes. 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 And there are none opposed? And you're running unanimous, and so carries. Um, thank you all for your patience with this, as it was a whole new process for me to learn as well. And so I will pass along to you the um, advisories. Sign these. And our next item on the agenda is the level B paraprofessional and I assume Dr. McLeod you're going to speak to us being oh, that I, I don't see Mrs. Bellello or Dr. Zaleski with us this evening so so this is um, the reason they're not here is that this is no different than other situations that we've brought before you where students move into the district um, we've explained to you before that we do not pad our staffing um, we staff for the needs of the kids that are in front of us. And so when students move in, you know, you've heard from Dr. Zaleski before, that my expectation is the first thing that she does is review the needs throughout the district. And there have been times where, especially later in the year, as students maybe have less dependency on a particular paraprofessional need, and you know that that's something that we work to do, there can be student, there can be paraprofessionals who are freed up, who can then be assigned in other places. We are not in anywhere near that place. Um, and so we did have students um, who have moved into the district with some significant needs. Um, Dr. Zaleski has evaluated those needs, has met with Mrs. Bellello to see if there was any other way. Um, of supporting these students while not taking away from the support that's being provided in current programs and we've established that there is not 
Um, once again, this is another reason why, as we talk repeatedly, it is a, is a good thing to be able to prepay the special education budget. Um, and in this case, when we talk about a future budget transfer, um, it will, it's the prepaid special education um, that, this is my daughter, um, that I'm asking for you to vote. May I? Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. Please. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> certainly, Dr. McLeod just explained everything that was going on. Does anyone have any questions on the memorandum that we were? News. Sorry. She said congratulations. The memorandum <laughs> that was, I'm going to feel terrible if she was here when this all happened. <laughs> um, the memorandum that Dr. McLeod had added to our agenda materials and also any of the explanations that Dr. McLeod just had. So I just want to clarify. So this is coming from our prepaid sped tuitions. I see it in the motion. So I, it wasn't in the know, backup I materials. A, it's that interesting that you say that because when I when the agenda first was written, this wasn't in there. Um, and then when I came back, when I came back, I actually would prefer that the recommended motion state that we move to approve an additional level B paraprofessional to be funded by the operating budget. Yeah, that's what it says in the memo. Yeah, it, I think the added language is a little bit misleading because it makes it sound like you're not paying for it now and that well, we're paying, you know, so I just... It also seems to lock in the budget transfer source by saying that it's as a result of that, so I don't think that's, that's not typically the way that we handle these. No, these well, anyway. but we typically know the source when we vote. That's the thing. That's, I, I don't object to adding the staff. I object to not knowing where the money's coming from. Um, you know, I feel like that's the question that we ask every time. Um, so I just wanted a little bit more clarity on that. Um, so if this is coming from the circuit breaker account, it's it's not. So it's so I did because I did have, have this discussion. It, so it's coming from the operating budget. It's coming from the, the it's coming from basically the surplus that we project as a result of prepay. So it's coming from our projected year-end balance yeah <laughs> so that means we don't know where it is right now yeah <laughs> <laughs> right it's probably in special education tuition and then we that's can what ask that, that's so let me before is, yeah targeted from we'll definitely let you make an announcement in a minute right um but the question that is before us right now yeah. are you okay <laughs> <laughs> would you like to announce no. <laughs> um is it, Jean had a question about the, it states that it's being funded from the operating budget. The question was, was it being funded out of circuit breaker, like our existing circuit breaker account, or is this? No. Uh, okay. Not from circuit breaker. Um, it's pro it's so, so it's projected surplus as a result of prepaying SPED. Correct. I, I can't. I don't really understand that. I'm sorry. I can't wrap my head around it. So you're saying it's it's being funded out of the surplus that we don't yet have. It just seems backwards well, to me. No, last no. year's surplus. Technically, we have it because we budgeted an amount last and then paid and then prepaid with we end can, of year balances. We can pay this however the school committee wants it to be paid. So if you would rather recommend to me that we go back and fund it through Circuit Breaker. We can do that if, if that's something um, that you would prefer. There's, there's no problem with that. I was just, uh, you know, in, uh, I was basically following the recommendation of, of Mr. Dumas that this yeah, is. Yeah, I just don't ever remember doing approving it this way. something just out of the operating, but everything is the operating budget. Yeah. You know, so I, I just, I feel like we've had more clarity in the past about which particular line item it's coming out yeah. of I have absolutely no objection to hiring the person yeah. I just the funding source yeah. absolutely um, and I apologize that it's that no, it was, it's been, it's no been I, I do that it was not is not clear um, and if it's different so I'm thinking we have this definitely is not calling out circuit breaker which right. often we see that it says to be funded through circuit breaker I think Rather, it is to be funded from the ability that we had to prepay special education at the end of last year. So, what I, I don't know if this is, and this may. So, what we used to previously do, I think, 
and I think we, if I'm not mistaken, we directed Mr. Dumas that we didn't want to do this anymore. We used to do an early, early season budget transfer to salary reserve, and that's typically where this would have come from, for those some of those projected overages. But I don't. Last year, I be, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, we told him we didn't like that method right, anymore. Right. So we just took everything that was going to come in under projection drop it into salary reserve yep. and then pay it out of there. So it, this may be the reason why we used to do that. But well, I, well I, it, yeah, I, I, I thought we did the salary reserve um, more in relation to contract negotiations and things like that. So I don't, my memory of it is typically we do this out of the circuit breaker, but there may be a reason why we're not, you know, I'm sure there is a reason why we're not doing it this time. And again, I have no objection to funding. Obviously, we, we need to have this person. That's not right. And I, so, I don't mean to ha hang us up. So it's okay. So I, circuit breaker would be based on more the the prepayment or the the monies that are paid to the town from last year's student expenses. Right. Right. So it, it's a whole different pool of money. It's money that is there's a percentage that towns are provided with based on special education expenses to include out of district expenses, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a whole different funding source. Mm -hmm. This source was rather end of year, end of year uh, money that we prepaid to the special education account to provide additional um, resources for this very thing okay. and that's why i think he's but it doesn't say the special education the, account that's why the budget I'm line item would be sped would be sped tuitions right because that's what we prepay yes okay so are we able to state that we we approve the level b professional be funded from the special um education tuitions can we text ralph is that allowed so here's what we could do um, Probably not. Because I don't. It's Thursday night. Football. I don't love the. I don't love funding it out of circuit breaker because I'm potentially overly protective of that revolving account. Right. Um, but what we could do is we could vote tonight to fund it out of circuit breaker, and then to the extent that as we go forward, we do have that overage in the sped tuitions account. We could do a future expense transfer to basically shift it back. To well, not the operating if, budget. Not if it's basically like two different fiscal years, like she's describing. It is. I mean, it's fine if you want to do it out no. of the sped tuition account. Why I just. It, but it's not two different fiscal years. It's, it wouldn't be two different fiscal years. Because the, so the prepaid sped isn't, we use the year end balances to basically reduce our expense this year. So our budget has a built in surplus because this year's budget has a built in surplus. No, I know. I'm talking about circuit breaker. The circuit breaker, yeah. But, but the circuit breaker is in the revolving account. And it's always, it's yeah. always playing it's catch up. Right. It doesn't. But yeah. what you could just do is change the motion and have it worded the way you want it to be worded to be yeah, that, paid so that's what I'm against thinking. the sped tuitions account. Yeah, that, that would make okay. sense. As long that's as we're fine. sure we got money in there. But I guess we're we sure could clean we it up in the there. future. Okay, then, yeah, that's what I'd so that, that would that could, preferable could for Could you me. tell me how you want the motion to read, John? So I think Sorry. what we're saying, Dr. McLeod, is to have a motion where it says, move to approve an additional level B paraprofessional to be funded by the SPED tuition account, right? Mm -hmm. By the account, though. SPED. It's the, it's the budget line. Okay, so the sped, sped tuition, tuition line tuition. item of the operating budget. Yeah, I think that's I think that's it. Okay. Does anyone else have an objection to that? Okay. So let me read that again. Move to approve an additional level B paraprofessional. I'm seeking a motion to approve an additional level B paraprofessional to be funded by the sped tuitions line item in the operating budget. I got that. So moved second motion by mr graziano seconded by ms knight all those in favor yes yes yes, yes. and none opposed uh, it's unanimous and so carries okay dr mcleod could you please tell us why you had to get up from the table and take your phone oh well <laughs> yes i apologize so i am delighted to announce that uh, the girls have arrived. Oh, they both uh, are doing wonderful, breathing on their own. Say what that means. Yes. Yeah, so my daughter just <laughs> delivered twins. 
<laughs> and so I had to, uh, the call was coming in and um, I've been nervously awaiting the announcement. Um, we've been waiting for three days to be exact. <laughs> so, um, Congratulations. Isabel Congratulations. weighing in at four and a half pounds and Phoebe came next. Oh. And she is five pounds and they're pink and rosy wow. and beautiful. Oh, yay. Yay. So congratulations, mommy and daddy, and great job, Em. Uh, congratulations, congratulations to you. <laughs> you just That's like 150 percented or 300. What, what percentage did you just go up on grandkids? Like, I know, right? One I know, in. right? Yeah. <laughs> it's like a park question. Yeah. Isn't it? I think we should draw a diagram yeah. for that. No section. We can all get it wrong. All good. <laughs> really? No, wow. No section? No. Holy oh cow. Better. I know. That's great. Wow. wow. That's worth celebrating right there. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. Wow. All right. Well, I hate to move on to more no, boring no, no. stuff, but <laughs> I, I know you want to get out of here. Just, I couldn't imagine. The student that. activities account. So, yes. Yeah. <laughs> New business letter D, the student activities account balance increased requests. Dr. McLeod. Yes. As you will recall, um, I can't remember. It was a couple of meetings ago when we discussed the fact that the student activities account and the student athletics account, the two revolving accounts were going to become one account. And it was really, uh, you know, a um, issue of having access to the funds when they needed to be able to write checks. In order to be able to have access to the accounts, they sometimes had to go through some additional steps to get the monies transferred from the town where the savings account resides. Mm -hmm. And so because those two are combined now and because um, D really has oversight, um, D and Evan working together on this. Um, they are asking for an increase to the student activities account, which is now the combined account, from 75000 to 100000 um, which would allow them to pay all their bills in a timely fashion. There's still oversight in terms of the amount of money, and what it, all, all that it means is that as they spend down that money, then they go back to the town to, have it, to request a transfer from the savings account on the town side to the activities account so that they can keep it at a level um, where they can pay their bills. So that's what they're requesting tonight in a nutshell. Did anyone have any questions? Any concerns? Okay. Um, at this time, I would seek a motion to approve the increase to the high school student activities account balance from $75,000 to $100,000. So moved. Second. Motion by Mrs. Birchman, seconded by Mrs. Cavanaugh. All those in favor? Yes. 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 And none opposed? And it's unanimous and so carries. Okay. On to letter E, the school committee policy EHB, electronic records retention. And Mr. Ghosh is here to join us. I'm going to just grab his name. Thank you, Mr. Ghosh. You're welcome. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> Do you have any pictures? Did you get I, well, I wasn't. <laughs> uh, I'm going to get them while he's talking. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's incredible restraint. Yeah, we should put it on the projector. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Ghosh. <laughs> yeah, no, we can work on that. Live feed. I'm sure she'd be happy with that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess I'd start by just reviewing. Um, a little bit where we left off uh, at the last meeting where we had some initial information um, from our legal team. Um, and so the idea of looking at policy EHB, um, in summary, uh, just to give some historical background uh, to some of these uh, requested changes uh, from the legal team was that approximately three years uh, ago, the district uh, updated some of its firewalls. And as part of that project, those firewalls have, have filtering, web filtering um, uh, capabilities on them, which are things we were required to do to filter internet uh, for uh, students and staff in district. And, um, and we're being compliant with laws and made sure those were available. And when we did that, um, we had the capacity to kind of store web history or browsing history uh, for staff and students. Um, so since we were doing that, I thought it'd be important to take a look at the, at the current procedures for the, the school committee to make sure they're compliant with, with um, Massachusetts state law. So uh, I reached out uh, to the legal team and, and asked them, you know, some of the questions that I reviewed at the last school committee. And just to repeat, some of the areas that pertain to this policy um, 
one of them was really had to do with uh, web history um, and whether we should be capturing that and what were the laws around it. So um, just to read to the public, whether browsing history captured by district servers and the district network constitute public information, which must be disclosed in response to a public records request. Um, and the response um, from our, our legal group um, was that, yes, if browsing history is captured and stored in the district network, even briefly, that information constitutes public information throughout the period when it is stored and subject to applicable exemptions under the public records law. It must be disclosed in response to a public records request. Um, and so hearing that and seeing that, I thought it, we would take a look at the suggested changes um, in the policy, which are highlighted in red, and which I believe everyone has a copy of. Um, which in the first paragraph, um, and I believe in the second sentence, adds the, the keywords web history um, to the, that, that paragraph. Um, in addition, uh, lower down in the first paragraph in that last sentence, um, employees and students uh, are urged to refrain from saying things in an email that would not want produced as part of a public record disclosure or lawsuit. So I thought it would be important to include that language in the policy. Uh, to protect uh, not only employees but also students. So those are the initial changes um, on the first page. And then on the last page, uh, at the top, the first paragraph, um, the legal team also recommended adding the words web history uh, down in that uh, second sentence um, right after audio files. So those were the initial uh, recommendations um, by our legal group uh, to kind of be consistent with um, Massachusetts state law. I guess in, in addition to that, um, I would ask that the school committee maybe uh, kind of as they review the policy in the first reading is have some discussion, at least think about um, whether we need to be more specific in stating um, the number of years uh, we actually retain email. So when, I'm re when I was reviewing the policy, it doesn't really call out the number of years we actually should be retaining um, emails. So um, that's something I would ask that you consider. In addition, um, the current procedure for the district is to, to retain web history for 90 days. Uh, so I thought I'd put that uh, to you to have a discussion about whether that's appropriate or not. And I'd obviously be able to answer questions about why we do that and why we have it. Uh, and whether we should state, you know, the 90-day number in the policy or, or not have it there. Um, so those, after reviewing the policy, those are some, some questions I, I guess I bring to this mm -hmm. group um, as we start to look at the, some of the possible changes. So to that, to that last point, um, we don't state in this current policy the specific time periods that these types of records are retained, but we do reference back to our obligations under state and federal law. So our, our, our retention policies basically consistent with, with the law, with those, we're not, we don't do anything like over and above. No. And so, we're, and it, which, it's, it's perfect timing with the fact that we've been a Google school district and using them to retain our, our email for just about five years. So we're, so we're coming up to that time frame where, I just want to make sure that this policy is covering what we're going to do at six years and making sure there's no difference um, moving forward after six years. So I, I, I think I'm going to break from my typical feeling on, on the, when we reference our obligations under state and federal law, and usually I, I'm on the side of leaving the policy to reference the state and federal law, but it feels like if the retention policies in those laws change, we have significant oversight and procedures that need to change within the district. So part of me feels like this is something where we probably would do well to actually spell that out. And to the extent that a change got made in the law, it would actually be worth bringing back to the committee for a policy review. Um, so I, I, again, that's not usually where I am on these types of references, but I feel like this one, because of the implications of that, um, it feels like it would be worthwhile. And then also just from a policy reference standpoint, if questions do come up, I think it would be beneficial for people to have the actual time frames in the policy rather than basically sending them out to the the law to reference. Yeah, and I guess my, my comment back to the group too would be that some, if the minimum is, is a set number, let's say the minimum is six years, 
but maybe some districts are, are storing their emails for 50 years, you know, in, in that particular case, would you want to state that in a policy or not? If it exceeds what the laws are requiring, do you actually want to state that or not? I don't, I don't know the answer to that question, but um, for example, if, if we're referring to storing um, video uh, for 30 days, um, do we, and we, do we want to state that we're, we're storing it longer or less, even though it's, it's, it's beyond what's minimal but, re required by state law? But if we, were, if we were requested something, even if we didn't state it in the policy, if, if we have it, mm -hmm. we're obligated to produce it, right? So here, here's another issue, like a wrinkle in the whole thing, is that if your policy states that you're following the state law, but your everyday practices are either A, not consistent, or B, are longer than what the state law is, and you have litigation, you can't then say, okay, we, we actually saved these emails for eight years. We could have gotten rid of them, but our practice has always been to keep them for eight years. But let's get rid of them because we have litigation and they might be damaged. Yeah, that's what I meant. Yeah. So, and that's called in anticipation of litigation. You can actually have another charge filed against you and not criminally but it's like another claim filed against you because of that so you have to I think we as a district need to look at it from what are we doing like what what are our procedures currently for how long we're saving email how long we're doing web history are we at the minimum compliant with state federal law and then if we're actually compliant but we're saving longer than those then we then that's where i would say we would want to have the discussion of whether or not we want to be doing it longer than you're required because i mean my personal opinion as a attorney is that i would only keep it the minimal amount of time that you're forced to keep it mostly as a practice like it's, it's more of a it, it's a it's a better practice for you as an organization because if you're showing that that's that you are routinely doing a data dump on a routine basis you're not doing it because you're anticipating that any litigation you're just doing it out of like a cleansing type activity mm -hmm. but if you don't have that consistency and built in as a procedure um, then you get yourself into a lot of trouble so yeah. So, so I agree. I think we should align the practice to whatever we put in the policy, whether that is the lend. My feeling would be we should align the practice to the legal requirements as well. Right. But I, I don't know. I'll wait for other people's opinions. I just, I still think that in this case, I think it's worth stating with more specificity what those time frames are. In the current practices, so, you know, we're we're in a new system with Google, and we're we're currently set to to retain emails for six six years. So, you know, we could turn around and say, well, we'll store things for a hundred years, but obviously that's not what I'm hoping to do. So, <laughs> I'm hoping for a recommendation to stick tight to the law. Well, there's also a cost associated with that, right? With um, well, the cost is per the number of staff that we have, so it's not going up per so, year. As so it we doesn't matter the volume. More data, no. Okay. Not not as a uh, not as a Google for Education school. If it if it was a private sector, it would be a different different okay. matter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does anyone else have an opinion on whether or not you want to state specific, you know, a maximum a maximum and a minimum, or do we just want to stick with state law, or you know, where 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 our preferences are, or state and federal law, because we have to comply with both, but. And I would just add to that if, you know, for example, we're, we're currently storing video data for, for 30 days. Should we, should we specifically say that in the policy? It, is that the requirement or is the requirement less Yeah, that's, that? the, that's the recommendation and the guidelines um, you know, that we received from the legal team that um, uh, the district must retain all audio, visual tape, or digital recordings for a period of at least one month. Okay. That's so the same that's the minimum. That yeah. talks about emails, talks about the same one that we're citing refers to both time frames. I'd have to look to see if it's so. The exact what same they were up, referring to in here is a municipal retention manual that the state has okay. for different types of records that you would keep electronic records. And so our legal counsel has given us advice based on yeah, but mass do we, law. Do we obviously, cite that in the. I need to get back into it. 
I, I, I didn't bring my. I didn't think we got the opinion at the last meeting, so I left it at home. We so don't, we do. don't cite it. We cite it in the legal references. So what was, what was the so there's what a is statewide the retention the schedule that's referenced as on page 141, section F65. It, the one the one thing I am going to caution is that reading wow. aloud our Thank you. attorney's advice gives basically lose attorney client privilege so we're not going to provide our attorney advisory in our agenda materials um, for that reason so that we're not extinguishing the attorney client privilege but also you know we can talk about what they've told us, but we can't. Oh, I was just talking about if we're referencing them. No, 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 I know what you mean. I just mean, like, for all of us that have the opinion, like, reading it, you know, like, quoting it can extinguish your attorney client. I'm just asking, what is the requirement for email six years? Or was it sounds like you have six years worth of email? Six years is my understanding that meets the, meets the, we're about to get to six years. And that meets the legal requirement? Yeah, the minimum, my understanding would be six years. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I'd say, I mean, it's either going to be one way or the other. We either quote the legal reference or we put it into the policy or and or we put it into the policy. So there's a municipal retention manual yeah, that Massachusetts has, and it has various sections referenced in there. I don't know if we would have to re reference each individual section for all the different types of correspondence because, it, I mean, it literally goes through paper. <laughs> You know, like it's every type of correspondence. Mm -hmm. So it may just be that we state that our we are retaining records in compliance with the municipal retention manual, you know, as enacted by whatever state body enacted it. Um, certainly, I think council could give us some advice on how to particularly reference it in our okay. policy, but. Um, I think the bigger question that you're looking for from us is, did we want to go beyond what the minimum requirements are? Um, and I'm not encouraging that. I'm just, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm just, I just want to make sure we're clear and all on the same page. Sure. And I guess is the question, do we put these types of specific numbers in the policy or do we have them procedurally um, so that I can communicate those procedures to staff and everyone's on the same page? You know, how does that happen? Is it through the policy or is it just through... The procedures through my office so <clears throat> the one question i have in relation to what john had brought up was you know from from a policy standpoint i would prefer not to put specific numbers in here and i would rather you reference the manual but my question is for your office the technology office mm -hmm. how are you notified when these when changes are made to this munis, you know municipal retention manual how are you going to be aware that those those because really what's the problem for the district is if we're not operating in accordance with those timelines and someone can pierce it saying well actually you destroyed materials because of some litigation not because you were following the manual so that's where my concern lies sure. um because otherwise i don't think the policy needs the timeline I, I think it's more important that we have a way of making sure that our technology department is following whatever it is in place at that time sure. and so that it, it that my concern is it puts a lot of onus on your team sure to be up to date with that and whether or not like john said it should trigger the school committee to look at the policy and check in with the, your team or how, you know what is the check and balance on that sure and I, I would say most of you know my information obviously comes from um, colleagues or it comes from job like meetings or it comes from email reminders from certain groups like ferpa or just um, emails that i get through certain associations that might update me on mm -hmm. certain legal changes that are related to this field um, other than that, it's continual renewal of the of the policies, and when they're coming due, it, we're, we're looking in, uh, into it, researching it, talking with legal groups. But on a on a day to day basis, I, I can't say I am reading all the legal changes all the time, as none of us probably are. But um, I, I, I rely on those I groups. <laughs> <laughs> I rely on those groups and and, and mm -hmm. keeping up with similar people in districts across you know Metro West to figure out what they're doing. So there is. A lot of information coming in so i think that is adequate enough yeah um, but i just want to make sure that 
so you know, what we're doing is in is in line with what the policy is. Sure. I mean, I'm not hearing anybody wanting to go above and beyond what we're required to do, <clears throat> for okay. one thing. So I think as long as the policy is written that we are meeting the expectations of these state and federal laws, okay. I, th I, um, I think that that's adequate. And I think to Lori's point, it is hard sometimes when you're putting, it sounds like if once we start putting specific um, amounts of time in the policy that's a really really long list okay. and so we have other policies that reference procedures mm -hmm. it's much easier to update procedures you can do that without having to come back to the school committee and go through this whole you know three reading process um, to do something that's a legal mandate anyway so I think my recommendation would be if we can reference the, your procedures okay. on our little chart here at the end reference the laws that we're complying with and maybe add into the policy that um, your your procedures will be reviewed annually or something so that okay. it sounds like you have that information coming to you all the time anyway but that you you know that you make the affirmative effort once a year to double check and say is this still the right amount of time for all of these categories then maybe that addresses kind of all of the concerns so that we are checking regularly that these are still the appropriate amounts of time and we're not making any changes in reaction to anything other than the law as you know as Lori's pointing out nothing related to litigation or anything like that but at the same time we're not so overly specific in our policy that if those things started to change frequently that we'd be reviewing this policy at every meeting okay. you know um, so I don't know if that's a good compromise um, but I'd throw that out there and before I forget too, there's one place I think we need to add students okay. um, in the last paragraph on the first page it says staff members and school committee members are provided a district email account um, that sentence but students also are provided that and this is I'm sorry in the first sorry on the first. last paragraph oh. of the first page it's the first sentence I think it just needs to have students right. added to it okay, okay. right here. Yep. yeah gotcha staff members students, students and school committee members okay okay I think those suggestions are great Gene I, I mean I I support them yeah I think that I, th I think that checks all of the boxes yeah. in terms of the specific okay. reference to that uh, so we'll make those so, changes yeah. and bring it back to the next meeting for fun mm -hmm. for approval and vote. okay um, and the other note I made so is to reference the laws on the grid and add a sentence about the procedures being reviewed annually. Um, my question, and it might be a different um, policy, Ashok, the piece in the legal ad advice around personal hotspots. That, yeah, that would be the um, acceptable use policy. Okay. It falls Fine. under yeah, IJ Great. and DB. All right, then. Okay. So we are having no action tonight, right. and we'll bring it back for second review. And I, Dr. McLeod, I assume we didn't get any response from the public on. They would have gone to you, but we did. We did. Um, oh yeah, no, I didn't get yeah, anything. We did. Um, <laughs> we did get them out on listserv. So I saw them go out on listserv, but yes, no, I didn't receive any yeah. responses okay. on the and any of the policies that went out on listserv for that matter. Um, okay, so we will not taking no action on letter E and moving on to letter F which is school committee policy KHC distribution of materials which is for our first reading okay and this was in relation to the issue that um, I'm gonna forget his name right now you'll have to refresh my memory as to who brought this up was it town, town clerk? clerk. Oh, do you? I kept wanting to say town constable, and it wasn't right. Okay, I'm, I'm, I've caught up now. Yes. Um, so this went to town council first, and then we received um, some input that felt quite broad. Um, it, it felt that we wanted to kind of take a little bit closer look. So we did send it off to our council for her input and so the changes that you see redlined um, are basically have has been reviewed by her and make the changes to provide a little bit more specificity around uh, the distribution 
specifically as it would affect the functioning of the school program. And that's what she was trying to um, point or include. So as you see it, uh, adding the language that you see redlined in the first line, um, posting of signs which are likely to disrupt the work and discipline of the school is not permitted. And then added under uh, not to be limited to, um, added any inappropriate purposes which otherwise violate any district policy or rule. Uh, in a nutshell, what this would mean would be, I know that the um, RSRO, Phil Powers, had concerns about to this point, uh, dis um, disrupting the work and discipline of the school when people were in the middle of the parking lot, for example, and they, they were distri distributing pamphlets and information in the parking lot during a school day um, when we were holding school on a day that when there was voting. On a day when there was not voting and they are standing in the parking lot, there would not, not be concern on the part of the school department. And that this is what this is supposed to distinguish between those two situations. So for our upcoming election on the 8th, um, there is no school in session on that day. So it would not be disrupting our program in that case. Mm -hmm. Did anyone have any questions or comments? I don't have any questions about the additions, but I'm looking at this section about request to distribute or carry and or post signs on district property. Um, and I'm wondering if we are actually following this as a practice. Where, so Jean, again? This, um, this yeah. big paragraph, request to distribute or carry and or post signs on district property. Oh, yes, we are following that. So when there's a town election, for example, oh, oh. all of the candidates file seven days in advance with the publisher of their signs. I'm sure we do as far as, like, banners on the tennis courts. Okay, so I'm looking at the first sentence. When I said, oh, yes, we do, I was looking at the first sentence. Any organization or person desiring to distribute written or other materials. Um, that certainly is something that is, is followed. And that includes, you know, posting signs on the um, tennis courts, for example. Yeah, Water no, I know. But, I mean, the way it's written, it would also apply to, to yeah. all the candidates holding signs. And I no. suspect we're not doing that. No. So how would you change it? I'm not sure yet. Oh. That's, I just I just am reading it thinking sure. I think we need to do something because okay. I, I think it's overly burdensome on you as well as not likely to be known sure. or followed by those particular people. I think almost everyone at this table has violated that policy. Pretty sure all five of us <laughs> are not right. followed yeah. um, procedure. So is that school property in front of the water tower? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. It's our drive. So yeah, we have yeah. all mm -hmm. violated some of us on more than one occasion. We're getting math, <laughs> we're getting math problems wrong. We're violating policy. <laughs> Not our best meeting. No. <laughs> um, and I think you know, I think it's very relevant and applicable and consciously followed for like the banners on the on the tennis courts. Um, See, here's my other question though. So. I I understand and certainly I don't like the fact that I've been in violation of the policy, but really what the policy, like if you're in violation, what that does is allow the district to tell you to leave. Right. Right. So if the district doesn't tell you to leave. Mm -hmm. but, but the issue is then we're inconsistently applying the policy on that one day a year. Potentially. Yeah, I, I get that. Um, is there a way to add a line about um, like what are you going to do then? Discriminate and say town town uh, uh, candidates it, don't have to apply. Well, and, and that actually I think would violate the town sign by law or the which has to do with the state law. Well, yeah, yeah. You can't, the con you can't do the content signs right. signs down, you had to be holding them. I remember that. Yeah, like they can't be affixed. Them down, you couldn't yeah. do that, but you could hold. So there's some other thing that was governing people thinking that was the rule. 
I didn't know if maybe if we took out carry and it's really just post, which is how I thought it was. The problem is if you take out carry, then you open then up. Everybody can you do can, it. Yeah, anybody yeah, can just exactly. be walking around that driveway so that with a sign. Out, all kinds of well, signs. Well, I guess the other part in here is like where it says it must identify by name and address both the publisher and the approved applicant. No one has their addresses on their signs. I thought that was the application had yeah. to. Oh, and is that what it include was? It. Yeah. I mean, no, it know. says all materials and signs must identify by name and address, both the publisher and approved applicant. Oh, yeah. Well, I guess oh, well, in that case, I mean, our banners don't put that on there either. Um, Can we exempt so one, one day thing, of the year? You know, and I'll remind all of us of, of this. One thing that this has allowed us to do is there were a couple of situations last year where there were flyers placed on people's cars right. that ended up all over our parking lot and in the and we were able to because we had this policy right. in place require those individuals to come and pick up their trash. That, right. And I don't right. think any of us I don't think any of us are are, are against any the, the policy. I think we're just trying to square right. that practice of I, sign holding on election day. Right. I understand. Which, but the uh, policy itself is broader than that, which is right. what we're right. struggling with. Right. right. No, I mean, and I think that's also a really important um, because we didn't used to have that, and right. it, it was really starting to be an issue with yes. leafleting of, um, of cars. So the first sentence is accurate. The rest of it provides so much detail and so many requirements that I wonder if that serves a purpose or not. See, I think the concern is it provides a lot of detail, but it, again, we're talking about one specific situation. If we were to remove that language in deference to that specific situation, we are opening up, again, anybody to basically stand in the driveway of the middle school with a sign. On election days, yes. But well, on, on the other but hand, it I would, but I would, would you know. would you put in there election day? I would suggest that oh. we put in some language around elect oh. to call out elections because I can tell you that I have not seen this level of detail on elect, on applications, no, right? And so um, I don't see all of them because some of them are repeated. And but the names of the people and the number of representatives of their group. I think that's probably a bit of a crowd control that, issue, right? Mm -hmm. But the mater the signs must identify by name and address the even the ones on the tennis courts don't put down the no, address no, of the, right that's just not I'm the saying. room or on the, the banner no right. and that's why i feel like there's too much detail it called out here well you could just take out that one line on materials and signs yeah. must identify the name and address both of the publisher and approved applicant because you're already going to have the you're discretion above to approve yeah. the materials right. so where, where it says all materials and signs must identify by name and address both the publisher and approved it. applicant Uh, and what about adding something in about um, election day? I feel like this was kind of written with election day in mind, though. Like, but, it, but it's they're prohibited if they haven't been approved. It seems like it, though. Like the number of people who are going to be standing out there. Was this pulled from a? Uh, was this written from scratch, or was this pulled from an MASC policy? No. So this is the updated one that we did back in March of 2016. Oh yeah. At Phil's request, and we added some language about the signs, Kelly. Mm. And so we'd have to go back to see what was there before, but that's why it feels like it was written yeah. for elections because he was concerned about safety. And then right. we got caught up in what does the school committee's policy have the right to overstep state electoral laws and regulations and the answer was no and this language allowed us to include language that talked about disrupting the work and discipline of the school and in that case this would trump right. so can we then in lieu of adding something else to the policy just request from candidates at large uh, that are if they would like to carry a sign on school property on election day that they must submit an application. I, I kind of like that idea. I do too. Well, if, if I had known this was it, I would have done that. But it, right. Know, I think I we just either. have to, we just have to publicize it. I, don't get me wrong. Right. Having had to do it twice for my own campaign, I would be happy with a policy that banned sign holding it on election day. <laughs> but, um, yeah. but I recognize there are others in town who would not agree with that stance. Um, yeah, I think I, I, I don't, I, I kind of like the idea of the application. Be I, I, yeah, I you don't. could give this back to the town clerk 
to give to candidates Each candidate. because yeah. like a selectman wouldn't know that they have to go to the superintendent to stand by the middle school on election day. Right. But they could give this policy as part of the here's your packet for Yeah, and yeah. Mr. Wiseman could disclose his trailer and the whole nine yards. <laughs> Does that count as a representative? <laughs> <laughs> I believe signs are allowed to be attached to that because it's on wheels. It's on wheels. Okay, tell me what you'd like included. I think just that one sentence needs just to be taken out and I leave I the I took out the sentence, <laughs> but the, what about... We don't need to change the policy for the rest of it. We just need to reach out to candidates and let them know they need yeah, to submit this to application if they intend to hold signs on yeah. school property. I don't think that's I think if we let no, the town no, clerk know to notify candidates... Well, maybe you can also just give the town clerk, in addition to a copy of the policy, once we vote it, give them some of the application forms. Yeah. And yeah. they can just, when people re return their papers, they can get a copy of both things so yeah. they understand. It's not but burdensome, you, it's just no. a matter of knowing. Yeah. So for know. national elections, so they wouldn't go. have gone through the town clerk, correct? Like That's true. We just need to make sure it's put out to We've just imposed restrictions, restrictions on ourselves. It's okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, I'm impressed by that. <laughs> um, they don't reference the applications. Is that okay? Oh, we should probably put mm -hmm. that on there. So under the procedure procedures. Procedures. Yeah. So I'll have to find out where that is, and then um, disseminate this information in a way that is timely, so that people know that it's a requirement. Okay. Because that's coming up quickly. It is. Okay. Um, well, well, certainly we could notify the. The head of the Democratic committee in town and the Republican can. committee in town, and it's, it's next month. No, they said the schools closed that day. Though. Yeah, the so okay, right, closed. you're right. So is but it you still need to have a day? It, I don't think it has anything to do with whether or not schools in session or it, not. You still need it. A, you still need an application. No, they still need the application. Still the application. Yeah, oh, we can just do. say no based oh, on disruption okay. to school. Correct. Right. I see. So I, I think, based on the timeliness, is the school committee comfortable? Um, making a motion on this tonight? Uh, if I just remove that sentence and reference the, the application. application? Yes. Yeah. Did we uh, get any public comment? No, we got it? no comment on it. <laughs> we will now. <laughs> 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 okay. So at this time, I would seek a motion to amend policy KHC as we, well, as outlined in the agenda materials and discussed this evening during our meeting. As amended. We need two amendments. As amended. As amended. So moved. Second. Motion by Mrs. Cavanaugh, seconded by Mr. Graziano. All those in favor? Yes. 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 Any opposed? And it's unanimous and so carries. Our, Thank you. You're welcome. Section letter G, school committee policy FF, naming of facilities or events, up for a first reading. And this policy also did not receive any public comment. Uh, it's there for your consideration based on obviously um, the upcoming new, new building. And I was asked by the ESBC to um, reach out to the school committee to see what, um, where we are with, with this. You know, in terms of so two things. One is: is there any need to change? Is there anything in policy that the school committee we might as well review it, given that we're about to maybe not change a name or keep a name? So first of all, is there anything in the policy that you think needs updating? And then secondly, um, what our steps are going to be in terms of, you know, making that decision? So any changes to current policy? Mm -mm. I think it's nice and robust. Okay, mm. robust is good. And then do you want, oh, sorry. Is there no procedure already outlined? Because it's interesting that it states it is expected that an orderly announced procedure will lessen the community or factional pressures. Well, there are procedures in the policy. Okay, other yeah, than. I think this is the procedure. That's what they're referring to. That is the orderly mm -hmm. procedure. Okay. Why don't we reference a Westboro public school policy and a Randolph public school Probably they adapted are adapted from, from the language. From we took their language. Yep. Oh. It's like a sighting. It's our footnotes. <laughs> so we don't get accused of uh, plagiarism. plagiarism. Uh, did anyone have any additional comments, questions, corrections? Mm -mm. All right. 
then I don't think we have to do anything because we're not changing anything. Yeah. <laughs> well, are, were you, Dr. McLeod, you mentioned, are, are, we look, are you looking for general time frames in yes. which we might want to kick off this orally announced procedure? Yes. They <laughs> Is there a requested <laughs> timeline from them? They have asked us, me, to ask you what your timeline will be, not the other way around. Um, okay. So they, they mean they got into the logistics of how big the sign was going to be and where it was going to be, mm -hmm. and would that affect the name of the, the future building and all of those kinds of things. So okay. um, that's interesting. That's whether we do we sign. form a committee or what, 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 do, what has to happen next? So um. I, I do think that while it seems like some distance away for the school to be opening, those considerations around signage, yeah. et cetera, probably make, make this something we should think about sooner That's rather it. than later yeah. um i feel like we should make it something fun though like let people like you can put suggestions in and well like, that's what it is yeah. that's what it is we, yeah. we we announce it and people submit members of the community either submit yeah. it to us in writing or they can show up at the meeting i think and we should put like little boxes at the library and people could like drop their little name suggestions and like make it as you said, fun to. Or at the entrances of schools, because no one goes to the library right now because it's under construction. <laughs> uh, it would be fun to solicit input from students, too. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Duh. Yeah, that is a good idea. Um, well, certainly, I mean, we can. Maybe we should just have another meeting where we have a discussion over when we want to kick it off. Um, or were you saying we need to make that decision now? I, I mean, I don't feel like we need to make that decision now, but I just was saying that it does, that the discussion around the signs and things like that make it, make sort of me realize that this needs to be done. Like, if we're going to have a discussion about it at a future meeting, I would suggest it's at the next one or okay. one s shortly following it, depending on what the agendas look like. Because I don't think we want to let this get too far into 2017 for a no. school. It's because so this is going to generate a lot of interest. Mm -hmm. And what I'm wondering is, do we want to wait till January when the bulk of our budget discussions are behind us? Yeah, I think potentially for a launch we yeah. do. Yeah. But but if, even to yeah. reaching out to people to ask them to submit names, like I can, that's going to be a lot to manage. I think. So I guess the way I'm looking at this is that if we discuss something in our next meeting, we're discussing exactly that. Okay. When do we announce and launch? Right. What is the process yeah. so we're going to discuss so we timeline. wouldn't we we could build but a timeline but not actually we're not actually talking about like launching it necessarily okay. In okay. The, but but that way we're prepared so it, perhaps the chair and i could prepare a recommended timeline for consideration at an upcoming school committee yeah. meeting yes um so maybe the november meeting can i suggest our first regular meeting in the november meeting sure can i suggest too that we should probably reach out to um uh whether it's compass or um, our construction manager because I think it would be helpful to know what the time frame is that we really have to have this done in order to take care of signage and things like they've that. They've already ordered the signage. I mean, they've already got mm -hmm. specifics on the size of the thing. Right, but I mean, depending on what we're going to do, we, we need to have the words on it, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, like right. they didn't order a bunch of letters that we can yeah, no, put no, up. No, in. no, no, <laughs> no. No, we haven't even so got yeah. sliding. Well, that's what I'm saying. So, so I don't, I, I, I doubt, that, like, so, the, so that we have this obviously in advance so that they can do right. whatever needs to be done. Yeah. Can, can you add that to your task list? I absolutely can. Okay, that would be awesome. And I will. <laughs> I was just going to say that. Um, since that's fine. You're in well, you said you guys were going to do it, but yeah, I'm no, happy to. Thank you. But the chair and I will put together a recommended timeline. John will reach out to ESBC. And I will bring this back on November the 6th. Do you want? Oh, that's my pen. No, it's okay. I got it right. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. So there's no action on agenda item letter F. We are, no, sorry, G. Mm -hmm. We did F. We did vote on that. Old business letter A, school committee policy IJ, NDB, internet acceptable use which is for our second reading. And thank you, Mr. Ghosh, for staying for that one. <laughs> oh, no problem. Um, OK, so we also had Mr. Ghosh, you had given us spot. some information on this policy recommended changes at our last meeting, which was the first reading. Mm -hmm. We did not receive any community input on this. Um, so I'll let you take it away. <laughs> OK. Yeah, I think um, kind of after reviewing the policy, um, over the last several years, I think the key item was really um, looking at adding uh, 
the line on page two about personal hotspots, um, basically not allowing students to create or use a personal hotspot in the school, um, which would then kind of avoid school filters uh, in a public setting. So that's the, the key language. Uh, and just something, it just addresses some issues that we've had um, in the past with some students doing that. And I think it would help making, help make the school environment, you know, safer and it would make it easier for administrators to, to manage uh, the building with that language in the policy. Thus, the recommendation. If someone's using a hotspot. Um, sometimes it's just visually, yeah. I mean, sometimes if you if you're if you're necessarily walking by and you they're using a phone, you can see by the icon up on the oh. on the top what they they're connected to. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> so, sometimes the the network uh, the network administrator can pick it up um, you know, on the Wi-Fi yeah. about certain devices and how they're connected. So yeah. um, it's it's sometimes it's random. So. But it's not a huge issue, but it has come up more than once as, a, as an issue. Um, so after kind of having conversations with our network administrator, it was suggested, and then we looked into it with council and thought the language would be would be appropriate. I have one edit and one question. Sure. Okay. So my edit is on the first page, the so one, two, three, four, five, sixth bullet is a duplicate of the eighth bullet, but except that it says assessing instead of accessing, which I think is the actual correct verb anyway. So I think you just need to remove. See, it says assessing see it. confidential. Yeah. Yeah. Take it out. You just take that one out. Yep. That whole bullet. Mm -hmm. that Actually, whole bullet. The, it's the fifth and seventh one are yeah. also duplicates. Oh. Copying yes. district yeah. purchased and or copyrighted software is in there twice. Yep. OK, got it. So you can take out fifth and sixth. Got it. Um, and then I just had a question relating to Twitter, mm -hmm. or if this, it says that staff will not fraternize with students over all these social media sites, including Twitter. Does that mean the staff cannot follow the students on Twitter, not the students can't follow the staff, right? Correct. And I, I guess we should discuss whether Twitter should fit under there or not. I guess so to, in, in my opinion, Twitter is a is a system that pushes pushes out information and there's no back and so I think there's no back and forth really I mean there is but it's not directly to a person necessarily um, but in this particular case um, we, we currently do allow staff members to have Twitter accounts right. that are put you know we have district obviously district Twitter accounts uh, where information is being pushed out um, so it doesn't prevent a student from following those staff members yeah I just wanted on, to make sure that didn't accounts. mean what that didn't fraternize didn't include that because I think that's a really good tool that yeah. okay. kids we, we kind of put that in that whatever used to be there my space. 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 so we were just old. trying to update it a bit but the language around but not limited to we were kind of just giving examples do they do teacher do staff members who use a Twitter account like you just described do they have to fill out the social network approval form yeah they're supposed to fill out that R2 the IJNDB R2 form which um, and then is approved uh, by the building administrator um, for Twitter or social media sites. So what would be another back? I was thinking Instagram, Instagram. but we use right. Instagram like the schools use Instagram too. So, but the, the, it would be different for if a teacher was following a student. I yeah, think that would be fragile. I'm not so so much concerned with the actual so right. social media um, vehicle as. What does, frater what does fraternize mean? Because yep. I think it's it's fine under these circumstances for students to follow the staff. It's just the other way around that I think we're trying to discourage. Correct. And in my, in my understanding would be, too, that in a typical maybe Facebook or a private chat, if there's a, a social media site or, or a site like Facebook or, or MySpace where there's private chatting going Instagram back and forth, that, so maybe that's then, that's, then that's what, you know, I think we need to take a look at. That's to me, is the bigger concern between staff and students in private spaces necessarily than, than public, because a, a, a tweet is, pub is usually a, t a public. But you no. can it can be if it's not a private, message. you know, it's yeah, it can be a private a private group. Yeah. Oh, no. Well, maybe we just need to say that then using okay. social network sites, which include private spaces, such as. Okay. But not limited to. If if the concern is around the private space, then you know, apropos of what we talked about in the last policy, you don't want to be in here every six months saying, oh, there's a new thing. So would it be right. the same thing as the second bullet then? Contact students via social networking sites, comma, cell, cell phones, 
texts. Well, I think maybe we need what, to call it out by itself. Well, because you are contacting students by those sites if you're like tweeting. Oh, <laughs> tweeting, like like I know, for instance, my third grade, my third graders' teacher tweets out stuff about their class, and like I mean, granted, she only allows certain followers, but I think to Jean's point on that first bullet, if you if you put it as fraternized with students using social networking sites that enable private messaging such as well that's why i thought it was similar to contact students because that's a yeah. private message so i thought it might be a little redundant yeah i tend to, I, I i think i agree because to that point you said so you said that in the in the twitter that that's why twitter feels like it feel, falls under the second bullet because even the in case of your daughter's teacher they she had to fill out this approval. form also doesn't say about contacting parents, yeah. just as about contacting students. So or. I think for me, it's the, it's the purpose for the communication. Right. And I think that that first bullet calls it out well, whereas the second bullet is not in keeping with our current practice, nor is it manageable in terms of staff members who seek approval to what? To, to, to contact a student by cell phone. Would they need to do that every single time they wanted to contact a student? So I think that the, the focus needs to be on the fraternizing piece and I, managing that. I just worry from a policy perspective, though. I, so I agree with you. I just, from a policy perspective, fraternize, to, to Jean's point of earlier, it, it feels it, a, like a bit of a vague okay. word. And so if Twitter's only called out in that first bullet, then if I read this policy, I could be inclined to believe that Twitter is not a usable form of communication. Okay. I, I was actually getting at well, leaving it out completely. I was oh, thinking okay. fraternize with students using social networking sites that enable private messaging, period. So even but, for those, you can't ask for approval. That's the difference between bullet one and bullet two? No, and then I would take out the next piece, contact students via cell phone, ta -da 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 -da, and, and include staff members who seek approval will complete a social network contract. I think the two bullets themselves are really confusing. And if what we are trying to call out is not following somebody, but rather using any of these social network sites to fraternize well so I it's think not that you it's not that it so i think we need to be careful in the first bullet then it's not that we're that we would be barring them from using social networking sites that have the capability okay we'd be barring them from using the capability because again if yep. you say any social networking sites that allow direct communication yeah twitter's out right we don't want them using the direct messaging capability of twitter but we obviously i mean i know well isn't I, this really come down to uh, contacting students for non-school matters right 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 well and that gets back i think the word fraternize i think that's right. the the issue of uh, uh, do we need to or do we just need a better uh, uh, is it need to more clearly define what fraternize means or maybe it does i haven't looked up the exact definition but. and i would think too i because of the evolution of all this i mean i think initially my understanding would be in the first had cell phones and and, and text messaging first came out i think the policy was trying to govern that process and making sure that students weren't going back and forth with teachers on on private lines and then as that change and developed and social media came on these things started to get commingled <laughs> together mm -hmm. so i guess do we need to pull that out and do we need to call out maybe the rules around specific cell phone usage and then a separate line dealing with social media sites or not because to me it seems like they're getting muddied a little bit here you know, what is, the, what is the rules and regulations around a cell phone and contacting a student on a cell phone or a private cell phone versus just pushing out a tweet? What's the differences there? Right. And do those need to be called out separately? Because are, are there scenarios where a coach needs to call a student on a personal cell phone? If that's the case, is there a procedure for that? Is there a form that they fill out to get approval to do that versus pushing out a tweet to a group of people on a team? Is it a little bit of a different process and maybe some different rules need to govern it so i i mean for me uh, the filling out of the form seems a bit draconian to me just sure. from the state unless you're doing it I, I feel like if you're doing it for like a classroom project or something like that like that makes sense like where you have a teacher who's 
creating a Twitter page that she's going to advertise to all the parents or something sure. like that. I, I see the need for a form for those type of instances, but having a coach who might be in an emergency situation who is going to, in the back of their head think I didn't fill out a form and maybe not make a call they should have made just because of the fact that they didn't fill out a form mm -hmm. it is where problematic for me so I feel I feel like really what we want to get at is it, it, you're talking about inappropriate use of social media or other messaging vehicles for contact with students to unrelated unrelated to school Mm -hmm. you know sure. or or an, a school related activity or a sport mm -hmm. so regardless of whether it's <laughs> that's, you know, a, that's perfect right there rather, regardless of whether it's cell phone right. or mm -hmm. computer or what have you yeah, like that's what it is you're media. trying to create a yeah. policy where the, if the teacher does that then you have a policy that says you knew you shouldn't have done it that way you right. know and like if we start going down this path if we miss something even though it's just but not limited, right yeah. yeah i think it's better to take the medium out of it like okay. So does that mean we're not having the forms anymore, or we are? We're suggesting that we're not. Uh, I think there's also language in the teacher's contract that that also um, provides direction on this issue. Yeah, I was going to say, is there a handbook for the teachers yeah, that? Of course there is, yeah. So, But I, I think, to Ashok's point, in terms of managing it, um, it sounds like the suggestion that's on the table is that we would not have them fill out if we if we clarify the guidelines around um, as Lori just defined then I don't know that we need the, the paperwork Jean okay I, I I will just say I will be more I would be more comfortable if we like see this again at our next meeting just sure. to wrap my head around it because sure. I feel like we have a couple suggestions floating around just to see the wording and sure. that gives all of us a chance to think a little bit more about all right I might need to rewind what? it and copy yeah. it down because I'm not sure I could say it again <laughs> no, but, uh, yeah we could think about what our like f what our usage experiences have been and make sure that we haven't okay. inadvertently created a bigger problem than what we're trying to solve that okay a lot of sense. that's a good idea so I think if I'm recapping correctly um and I know Nancy unfortunately you're on the policy liaison role okay. but it looks like we're trying we're trying well good I'm glad about that because <laughs> you're good at it but that it looks like we're really trying to rework the social networking mm -hmm. section yeah that everything else everyone hasn't had any comments on was there any additional I mean obviously Jean you Just found the, yeah, the, the repetition so if we could work with that section that would be do you want me to rewind and try to rework well since you do that. minutes in policy that would be perfect <laughs> there we go yeah um if if you don't mind i mean i'm no, happy fine. to go over go over it with you as well like to you know kind of get where our, our heads were at but um Good. i've that got the recording you. okay awesome thank you so we'll bring this one back bring as back. well is that okay with you too mr Gosh? yeah that would be great great would you like it to be it before makes, 10 it makes it much easier if, once we have policies <laughs> cleared up coming to our meetings <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, we like having you here because you fix everything for us. I try. I, I was uh, I was a little nervous at the start when I was watching on TV whether the, the presentation was going to come out. I was getting ready to run to my car. Did you not just see Dr. Kavanaugh just She, she calmly was calm, you know, perfect. Fixed it. <clears throat> All righty. So, well, have a good evening, Mr. Thanks. Rose, unless yep. you're sneaking Thank around you. for the last. <laughs> I think I'm going to take off. Hurrah. Thank you all. Have a good night. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. Um, at this time, we have our opportunity for the next public comment, which there is no one here for public comment, so we can move on to items by consensus. Dr. McLeod. Oh, first let me ask, does yes. anyone like to move any of the items by consensus out to vote separately? In that case, I would recommend the school committee move to approve the items by consensus as outlined below. So moved. Second. Motion by Mrs. Birchman, seconded by Mr. Graziano. All those in favor? Yes. 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 Anyone opposed? No. no. So it's unanimous. Did you just say no? No, I'm saying I'm, I'm just answering your question. <laughs> saying he's I'm not, not opposed. I'm answer, I, 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 it's getting late. For that I you know. Say, is anyone but opposing? You say no, and then you're like, right. no. okay. So at this time, I would seek a motion to adjourn. So moved. <laughs> Second. Motion by Mrs. Kavanaugh, no. seconded by Mr. Absolutely. Graziano. All those in favor? Yes. 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 And it's unanimous, and so carries. Our next oh, meeting yeah. is scheduled for October 20th.
here at the high school library at 7 p.m. I will not be in attendance, so Kelly Knight will be chairing the meeting for you all. And the following regular scheduled meeting will be November 3rd at 7 p.m. again here in the library. Thank you and good night.